Right off the bat, uh, well, first of all, I'd like to call the meeting to order. Do I have a motion? So, second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. The meeting has been called to order. Uh, we do have a, a change to the agenda in that we're going to do executive session after okay. we're done with the agenda and then reconvene after exec session to come back into open session mm -hmm. for the, um, the um, documentation of a vote. Mm -hmm. So we'll do that after. <coughs> and um, then moving on to adjustments to the agenda, uh, the other <coughs> adjustment we have is for item number seven, which is um, Chris's, uh, the business manager report, we'd like to add the pre-K tuition as an item on that. Are there any other adjustments to the agenda? Okay. Great, then we'll move into presentations and discussion items. Ms. Camuso, field trip proposal. Hi. Hey. Uh, did you guys have time to look at any of the information? Oh, fabulous. Okay. So this trip is the one that I ran in 2015 also with the history department. It's the England, Ireland, Wales, and then there's the extension to Paris. So as you know, I run the international travel usually every two years. Um, this current trip that I'm going on in April is actually back-to-back -back years because the French teacher, Ms. Lynch, was interested in doing some travel. So the next one I'm looking to do would be two years from now, which helps to give students and parents time to save money. Sometimes students work in the summer and make a little to help pay for the trip or spending money. And the selection of this trip is based on both the English and the history curriculum. It aligns the best. And the trip um, was really successful in terms of student enjoyment and the feedback from them and the parents. So I thought it would be a good one to run again. Having been on it also, I now know some of the particulars and how they align even more with both uh, the history and the English curriculum. And we will be offering honors Britlet next year, which also ties in well. So students who take it next year will then also have the opportunity to go on the trip the following year. Even if they don't take it, that's okay, it doesn't matter. But it might kind of align well for students who have those interests. Mm -hmm. So it is 3600 um, but again, it goes over two years, so that <coughs> makes, makes the cost a little bit more manageable, and as usual, it's the same company, you have tours, and so it includes transportation, dinner, breakfast, uh, most of the places that we go on the itinerary, and the hotel. So it's lunch and spending money, and then getting from here to the airport and back. Mm -hmm. as well. So we are looking to have it approved so that I can hold an informational parent meeting and start sharing some of that information to hopefully get parents and students signed up before the end of the school year. A quick question. You, you referenced um, you were hoping to get at least 12 students. Yes. Does the price um, adjust at all depending on the number of students from here or no. is it really a fixed? Yeah, it's fixed. Sometimes every once in a while they do like a discount sale or something, it would be 99 or 100 off, and so if someone's already enrolled, that money comes off of their enrollment as well. But they'll do like, you know, sale periods, if you sign up by now, it's $200, and so that can get more people signed up, but the initial current one is just the standard price. So no, it doesn't, it doesn't affect that, it just makes it slightly more fun for the kids and better. I mean, I would love to go back, you know, to my first trip, which had like 25 kids, that was great. Yeah. I would love to have a bigger group, but the last <coughs> few have been closer to 12. Last year was only six students, so it's just me and the six students. This trip we have 11 students, maybe 12. Okay. Any other questions? Um, I think I quickly saw, scanned it and saw that their Paris was a maybe. What are the factors that determine whether or not you go to Paris? Yeah, so the extension, we requested and the original price includes it. We have had extensions canceled before if another group isn't going on it. So there's a couple options. If you know, the other group that we're traveling with, because you travel with other groups to fill the bus and all that, if they don't go, the extension can either be canceled or sometimes if it's still possible, 
you can pay an extra price and it can continue. So that actually happened when we did this trip in 2015. The other group is not doing the Paris extension, and so we had the option to cancel or to pay an extra $100 to go still. So the parents all agreed to pay the extra $100 to go. They felt like that was worth it. So we did that, but you can also cancel and then you get the money back for the amount of the extension. So when we went to Italy and Greece, there was supposed to be a cruise around the Greek islands. Nobody else was doing that. That one got canceled. The kids got their money back. So you don't usually find out for sure about the extension until about a couple months before you depart. Mm -hmm. To kind of go along with that the whole time and then you wait and see and then you get your money back if they cancel it. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious. Yes. It sounds good. I'm just curious. Have you, what have you learned? What lessons have you learned about how to do these? Over, because you seem to be very experienced <laughs> with it. Yeah. Teaching's a side job? Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they've, they've been good. I think that, you know, for me, safety is always the number one priority. That can be a little more challenging in countries where students speak English because they tend to feel more comfortable and they don't want you to sort of shelter them as much. But they need that sort of continual attention, so communication is really important. I do now, I do three parent meetings before we depart, parent and student meetings. And at each one, we review some of the protocols, as well as the places that we're going, some skills they need, like reading the metro map in Paris, so that they're prepared. We talk about the things that they need to bring or don't need to bring on the trip. So the longer that I've done them, there's sort of small things like that that have become more helpful. I understand how it works with the tour director, and so making sure to talk to the kids about some extras that they wanna do, like on this upcoming trip. In April, we have a lot of extra time in London, so making sure that you always plan very clearly what you're doing with that extra or free time, uh, which is never really just free. They don't just run loose in London. But we'll talk to them about, you know, do you want to go up the London Eye? Okay, great. There's eight people that do. The rest of us don't. We're going to go over here while you go up the Eye. And so having all of that as much as you can ahead of time helps the trip go more smoothly, helps people in terms of budgeting, and then even sort of, you know, learning about some of the differences in traveling in other countries. Heathrow is real strict about uh, their their fluid ounces and things of that nature. We've been held up there before when the kids didn't really believe that they would be as strict and thought it was more like America. So, you know, you learn those small things and you try and warn against them as much as you can and it helps the kids to learn what it's like to be in this other place. There's a little bit more in terms of police force out in some of the countries than when we went to Italy last time. They had their uh, military officers out, similar to the way that you see in Paris, but that hadn't really been a thing before in Roman Florence. So you get kind of used to some of that, and you talk to the kids about why they're there and what that means. And um, so yeah, so there's a lot of different things when you travel. Yeah. That's great. So I make a motion to support the trip. Second that motion. Great. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Um, I think I'm supposed to keep, do you want me to keep standing? Yeah, so you're <laughs> on the next topic. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, the Gender Equity Task Force update on social norms campaign. Yeah, so I don't I don't know, because I wasn't here, sorry. The last one I know where Dr. McKenzie shared a little bit. So if I repeat too much, just feel free to let me know. Since uh, the last meeting, we held our reveal at the game on the 20th. And that was really fun. So that's where we had the kids all come out on the court. I don't know if any of you were there. Mm -hmm. go. And they unveiled three of the photos. After that unveiling, we've been <coughs> releasing the images on social media, on the city council Instagram account. We release those every once in a while. And then in between, we also release some extra ones. So there might be images of a famous celebrity supporting gender equity. And then Kind of the challenging part about that is coming up with the statements to go along with the images because we thought about, okay, we have all these images and we're going to release all these. But of course, when you post something, especially on Instagram, you're supposed to add words <laughs> to that. So I've been working with the kids a lot on that. And we talk about those together before those get posted. And then I've been keeping an eye on the pictures because I know we talked about making sure that there wasn't any uh, negative or harmful feedback on those. And we've been trying to sort of create more of a conversation with them. That part isn't going you know, as well as we would like, I think, in terms of people responding, but the kids might not know what to say all of the time. So 
So we do try and model myself or one of the other kids in the group will often comment and add something to that. A lot of kids like the images. Uh, we have another one that should be going out tomorrow. And then from there, we have a meeting tomorrow at lunch actually to talk about a series of conversations that we want to have around gender equity. So I met with Dr. McKenzie and we talked about having a first talk um, with the faculty leading small student groups where students would select their discussion leader based on their gender. So we won't assign students by gender, but students can select based on gender to try and have more um, gender similar conversations. Because some of the feedback that we got from the campaign has been positive and some has been negative, so we expect if it was all positive, we wouldn't need a campaign. <clears throat> And so some of that, I think, comes from a lack of understanding and education around men's issues regarding sexism as well. And so we thought having those conversations with someone of the same gender might be helpful to talk about, you know, how are you feeling? What's concerning you? And then after those conversations, have a series of student-led workshops where they'll have different topics. And the students will run those ones, and students can choose to be in certain ones. And then the final conversation would be one where we talk about what gender equity would look like and what we want it to look like, which would lead into our social norms campaign. And so that's how we would end the year with the social norms campaign. So that's kind of where we're going from here. So March and April are the places where we are having the small group conversations, and then the social norms campaign would be May and June, somewhere in there. Do you have any questions about any of that or anything else? Do you have a sense of uh, what, what percentage of the student body has an awareness about the camp, about the initiative in general? Are they looking forward to these things coming out? Or at least, you know, regardless of whether they're pro or con, like what level of awareness do you think they have? I'm going to say that I think they are relatively aware, but I can't quantify it. Mm -hmm. I know that after the reveal and when the pictures went up in the halls, because they're in the halls now, the middle school students had a lot of conversations with their teachers, so they visibly saw it. I think a lot of the high school conversations have been between the kids, and so a lot of what I know about that is from what's reported to me, rather than a lot of dialogue in the classroom. So I know it would be helpful to have a better idea as to how much, so maybe even that first meeting where they're talking will give us a better idea as to if people understand what it's about and what it's for and you know what's happening and their thoughts on that. Because I don't have a total sense, especially at the high school level. But I think people are aware. I'm not sure that everybody always understands the intent, just like not everybody always understands, you know, what feminism's about. So I think it might kind of be similar to that. Thank you. So you've gotten both negative and positive feedback on the campaign so far. How are you guys using the negative feedback to um, change your change how the campaign's going. Yeah, so in a couple ways. First, the kids that shared that some of their peers weren't as supportive or felt like some of the statements or situations were made up and that they couldn't have happened to them. We talked at a lunch meeting about how any feedback, whether good or bad, can still start a conversation and how instead of being upset about that, they should try and have a conversation with their peer about how this thing did happen to them and how you know, it was something that was hurtful to them and trying to have more of a conversation about it rather than an argument. So we talked a little bit about that and then I would also say it's informing some of the focus of our talks. So you know, one of the proposed, or a couple of the proposed topics that I'm gonna share with the kids for the second set of meetings has to do with issues for men, um, like you know, like toxic masculinity, or the number of male students who are diagnosed with ADD or ADHD. So there's a lot of things that they don't even know that are issues for them, because I think a lot, not a lot, but some of the boys feel like it's just about the female students, and it's not, it's about all students. And so that's to your point about a full understanding of the, the campaign, and we did get as many then as we could to participate in the photo shoot, but it was only three, so that makes it a little bit harder as well. So we're trying to use some of that feedback to inform those conversations, but also to help teach the kids how to respond in those conversations instead of just being defensive about it, but to use that as a place where they can have a conversation about it. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great. Thanks for sharing that.
Yeah. Other yeah. questions, feel free to email me at any time. <coughs> That's great. Thank you. Okay, next, marketing, having public schools. Mr. Simmons. Okay, thanks for your time, guys. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm not sure how much of this subject you guys have any uh, background of pertaining to student enrollment, the competitive nature of the school. We talk about area. it almost every meeting. They, they, okay. they have to have their school committee packet, all the choice right. and charter. So you're probably more well-schooled about it than myself. Um, yeah. So I, I, I work here, and I'm also a heavy resident and a taxpayer, so I have several interests. And um, whether we want it or not, we are thrust into a competitive environment pertaining to uh, attracting students to our school and other schools attracting our students to their schools. Um, so the, we had a meeting, Dr. McKenzie called a meeting for uh, interested teachers and we basically talked about a uh, two-pronged approach, one being um, what can we do to improve the marketability of our school I'm um, talking about different kinds of certificate programs and whatnot. And um, I took a different approach in that we have a lot to market already, and we just are not marketing. Um, so I just I made like two sample ads. Uh, Dr. McKenzie and I spoke about using maybe the Gazette as a possible medium for putting them out there, because uh, that's where I happen to see ads for other schools all the time. And so uh, here, here was one ad, and these are just sample ads, um, so we wouldn't have to go any like this. But so, so one thing our, our school has that I feel other schools do not have is uh, a business program in, in the high school. Um, and we're the only school that I know of that now requires personal finance to, uh, for kids to graduate. So I feel you know, that's something that we can market that, um, that we have. Um, so I, you know, I, I listed a bunch of things that I cover in those those classes, and hopefully some students and some parents will see that and be interested and have their kids shadow here, and then see all the other awesome things we uh, we offer. So this was this ad was marketed towards your ninth through through twelfth grader. This kind of this kind of ad, um, and we could we could do all kinds of ads. This is just something that. I could speak about because classes that I, I teach and I, I don't. Um, and then I mean another ad, this is where we lose a lot of kiddos, is going from uh, sixth grade to seventh grade, to the middle school, we lose a, a, a bunch of uh, students. So um, one thing that we offer here that a lot of other schools don't is a middle school technology program. And uh, we have uh, awesome equipment, the district's um, and helping carts and the trustees are all super generous in giving us lots of supplies. So we have a total modern uh, robotics um, program now. We, I've integrated it with uh, the 3D printers in the library, so the kids are designing custom parts for their robots. Um, and then I still teach a couple different basic programming classes, uh, some web design, those kinds of things. So this, this ad is uh, targeted for seventh and eighth graders and this is a very popular class mm -hmm. um kids like it a lot of hands-on stuff a lot of creative type stuff um and if it, if it came to the point where we needed to have more sections open because of of the class um my my schedule is is pretty easy to manipulate so that um it wouldn't be too hard to, to offer more more of those classes um, so yeah, so this is where, uh, these are two, two places I felt we could target without really changing anything, just to promote how awesome our school is. Um, so yeah, so, uh, any, any questions about that? I, I like the approach yeah. that we've been talking about, some of the value add that we've added into the um, curriculum recently that we wanted to, you know, showcase. Definitely, um, these two are definitely differentiators, and there are more, there are more differentiators um, here at Hopkins, but these two are especially valuable and marketable, and um, we could experiment with what a Gazette ad looks like. I think in parallel, it would be great to have um, things that we could circulate 
on social media that are small, like smaller versions or shareable versions of these kinds of ads. Um, and a campaign around these two um, subjects in particular would be a, a draw. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great idea. We talked about, um, so, so, so one place we could market this immediately to are the sixth grade parents. Because some of them might be thinking about, you know, that's the time to, to send their, their kids to another school. They start in fifth. They start in fifth, yeah. yeah. So, so, so that could be a, a good place to go. And uh, the return on investment, just, you know, one, one student saying you already have a good return on investment. And, you know, as educators, um, I'll speak for my fellow teachers, we're typically not used to the competitive environment. You know, we go to edu education school, we have that kind of stuff. So a, a lot of us are not used to uh, the coming pressures that are going to come to the area of schools. You know, with the charter schools and Chinese immersion school and the, the tech schools, they all have great things to offer. And we have great things to offer, too. Um, so I uh, would just like to market those things. Right. I think um, one of the connections we've made, and you've, you've mentioned it being a Hadley resident, is that every year we're approving school choice seats. And our goal is that every seat is able to be filled. And if this is a, you know, something that helps motivate somebody to be able to, oh, they have that too, and that's of importance to them, I want to shadow somebody and see this. And it's not just you know, a certain niche that they might think that we're part of, then I think that's only gonna help us, you know, mm -hmm. get somebody um, perhaps seeing a side of Hopkins that they didn't realize was an emphasis and something that we're proud of. Yeah, absolutely. I, an idea and then, um, well, an idea. Um, I don't know if we offer any summer programming at all or whether uh, faculty have any interest in doing it, probably case by case. Um, but if there was, um, and if parents are always looking for things for their kids to do this <coughs> summer. Mm -hmm. at, at this high school age bracket, I'm sure it's different. Many kids work, many don't. Um, but looking at the $1,000 uh, Minecraft camps that Amherst College offers, so they're very cost prohibitive camps, those fill up within you know, a couple of weeks' time. And so when you have parents who are looking for things that differentiate their kids' education, and even if you offered something that was super manageable, like 12 seats, just the awareness that would spread, even if it was like 12 kids, two weeks, and a pretty handsome rate, um, and the awareness that would spread about Hopkins having this capability would be huge. Yeah, that's a good idea. The library's done something in past summers, like a coding camp, but I think it was, as you said, a small scale, but I don't know that there was any connection necessarily to, oh, and by the way, if you come to Hopkins as a middle schooler, you know, there's only more, you know, but I agree that that might be also a good, mm -hmm. we've been looking at ways to connect with mm -hmm. the new, you know, facilities and excitement around the library and the senior center, this may be another connection as far as a summer opportunity is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can, all, we can we always need to keep improving and enriching the curriculum we have, have to offer. Um, and, and so, you know, as an educator, I plan on doing that. Um, but at the same time, this is something that we, we don't do at all, as far as yeah. like let people know what we're doing here. Um, yeah, so. so I see two audiences, right? There's that internal audience, right? So we do lose, we have quite a attrition from eight to nine as well, right? And kids come to right. Smith Boat. We do. That is, is going to be a tough thing to compete against, mm -hmm. uh, realistically. Uh, I'm not opposed to trying it, but that, that's going to be tough to compete against that tech track. Yeah. Right. I would agree with that again also, not that I'm opposed to that, but if, if we could really stop, um, if we could stop the bleed around choice, of course, and still maintain our benefit, we would be in, in really good shape. And the reason it's hard to compete with that tech track is that often children choose that. The chapter seven <coughs> for education is not just a shock. I mean, it's a, it's a whole different animal. 
Um, you need a whole different teaching certification to be there. You have a separate superintendent license to be the superintendent of a Volk Tech school. Um, it's, a, it's a whole different animal. So sometimes students say, I'm doing this because I want to, ha I want to be apprenticed into a trade, exit high school, and be ready to start my business. Right. Uh, some of the, the students who get A-plus certification, some of our <coughs> students who are used to work, um, they exited LPVEC. They were picked up immediately at the age of 18 for jobs in um, computer science, and their employers were paying for their bachelor's degrees, and they were starting mm -hmm. at a pretty high rate. But that's the, that's why sometimes, not, again, not that we're opposed to it, but if we could just, when students are choosing another public school, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that's sure that they know what's available to them in that mm -hmm. fifth grade. Even, you know, I agree with you, Mara, starting at that fifth grade, so they really truly know what options they have, so not losing a student for something that we offer here. Exactly. And um, to springboard on the business idea, we have a, a fair amount of students that take these classes and go on to major in business, I think, college. Mm -hmm. um, a, a recent student of mine just got accepted to uh, Eisenberg, so. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it's possible we could seek out some kind of partnership and use that. To, mm -hmm. to both promote that program in the school, and parents would, would see that. Mm -hmm. um, the thing about these audiences, I'm just I'm wondering <coughs> if um, this this type of ad campaign could benefit from maybe having some of those students that are in the that, that are in the uh, seventh and eighth grades like design those young know, like design that ad that's targeted towards those kids and their parents. And maybe um, the older kids um, that like once once you have testimonials and stuff like that, like have it that, that really have that personal touch on it. Just think about these different audiences, kind of stuff that might um, attract them themselves. Yeah, it's a good idea. So I, I like your idea, and I I tried to do a uh, competition in one of my classes for making ads. And my first attempt at it was not um, as successful as I, I'd like it to be. <laughs> <laughs> try again. Uh, yeah. But, but um, related to that, though, one thing that, that could help is some kind of documentary about what goes on in the class that the ad is linked onto YouTube, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Once you know, We'd have to obviously get people permission to be on there, et cetera, et cetera. But that could be some way that would have like a testimonial. But, be more to life. Yeah. I like that idea. I know you too. That's great. I like that. Yeah, I like that idea because um, these are role models of theirs that they remember mm -hmm. from elementary school, mm -hmm. and um, our school is small enough that these are recognizable people, so yeah. that could work really well. Mm -hmm. So I like the idea of the campaign. And there's there's, a, there's that internal audience you know, as a parent helping um, understand where, what what the difference is between sixth and seventh grade. Mm -hmm. It's important. I don't think I fully understand that. I'm not sure I still do, and I've had kids that are going through that. Um, I think we need to explain a little bit about what Hopkins is a little bit, too. And I know I work with people, and they don't know that Hopkins is the high school in seventh grade for Hadley. They yeah. don't understand that. Some private schools. It's a private yeah. school. Yeah. 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 I think we also, I think, I love that you're <laughs> highlighting some of these key things. I mean, I, I, like, I like that term, differentiator. Um, there's also other things, you know, where our, the low our student to teacher ratio, there's great sports, there's those kinds of things that I think are hard to find around here at, for um, the number of students we have. So and there's the, also the testimony of, um, and Mr. Simmons knows this well, because a pretty significant number of students will come back and visit him. The testimony of alumni who come back feeling like college is so easy to them because of the level of preparation that they have. And I know Dr. McKenzie has shown some data on the success rates of Hopkins graduates. Um, you know, being able to put something together where we could get, you know, some statements or testimony to that effect from some alumni who come right. back and speak with pride about the fact that they're really successful in college um, right. and, and what they're doing with their career. So that kind of thing where a, a public college preparatory, right? That, as opposed to, you know, we might have not have the niche of Evoke or a mm -hmm. Chinese immersion, um, but we're not. And so I was just looking at the, the, mm -hmm. the numbers of who goes where, mm -hmm. right? So mainly our folks uh, in Hadley, if they go to a, a non-HES school, they go to the Chinese school, uh, or they go to PBPA, right? For charters. For charters. And then remember the choice, which we have in here. Amherst, Amherst and Northampton. And, 
Yeah. So Amherst is the biggest numbers. receiver. Okay. Amherst is the, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So right, we're not, we're not going to outcompete those kids necessarily because they might be there. If you go to PVPA or Chinese school, you have a specific intent. Some may stay, but where are the other folks in the region? I think is that might like the college preparatory public school small classroom size setting that we have, yeah. right? So it's, it's about retention, but it's about also about educating others. Yeah. And I'm convinced if we can get them to come in in shadow, I'm convinced that the school will sell, will sell yeah. itself. Right. So specifically, um, what we're looking to do for you immediately, to use these ads in the Gazette to test that out, to um, coordinate something with sixth grade parents, with HES parents, inviting them, organize some sort of direct marketing to them. If you want to be here, it's, it's hard to get people out sometimes. We could probably talk about the best way, but marketing directly to um, the upper elementary. I'm working on letters right now for every, Mr. Beck meets with every single parent who comes to, of a student who comes to Hopkins. So you see, you see we have 13 queries right now of school choice for Hopkins right now for next year. Um, but we're also uh, able to, in many cases, send out letters. So I'm working on a letter for parents who right now, families who may be attending other schools, with the very information you're talking about, I'll include in the letter these ads, the size that you have, but also the letter includes, here's what's unique about <coughs> elementary, our average class size across the district is 15, what that allows for, that we have full-time music, we have full-time arts, we have the opportunity to study an instrument beginning in grade three, right? Yes. Four, three. Um, so some of the things that you're talking about, athletics and extracurriculars in that letter. Not too long that people don't read it, and so that would go to everybody, and then perhaps asking folks on the school committee who have access to the Friends of Hadley uh, page, that social media platform, um, if they would be mm -hmm. amenable to getting some of that information out. So another idea, mm -hmm. um, first the, the, that saying, uh, if uh, Muhammad doesn't go to the mountain, the mountain comes to mm -hmm. Muhammad. Mm -hmm. um, you are a rock star teacher. If you went to the elementary school and did a guest, you know, mm -hmm. Guest appearance with Mrs. T at her space, or maybe right in the classroom, and you showed off to the fifth and sixth graders some new awesome thing that they don't have at the elementary school, like little bits, or bring you a 3D printer. I don't know what they don't have, like you do, but um, something that shows just how amazing it is, and then you leave behind a thing, a flyer. I like, I like that idea. Yeah. So, so this year, the um, the elective teachers are planning on visiting the elementary school uh, for that whole process of mm -hmm. step up day when the kids come mm -hmm. the next time. So I'll I'll make sure to to bring something that will make it hands on, make it exciting. engaging, make it like a sample, a little taste of what they would get if they were in your classroom Just rather than wah, 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 wah. make it yes. sir. Yeah. If you could wear that sumo suit. Yeah, I'll wear a suit. That's a big hit. That sells, yeah. So also, and not, I, I think the kids these days are just so much more aware of the world in general and aware of their opportunities, but with the same token, making sure that while these classes are really cool, but what can they do when they get out of school? Like really, like what are their options available to them? Because somebody goes to school to become an electrical engineer, I mean, you can do so many different things, and giving them a real-life example, a specific example, or multiple examples of just what they could do. They could be working, you know, well, anything, right? I can't think of any examples right now, but really bringing it home for, like, if you take a class in my robotics, you know, here are some opportunities available to you. You could go to school here, but what does that mean? Like, you know, it's great to have a great class, and it's great to have this great, but what can you do with your life? So finding something that excites them when they get older and you, it sounds like you would be able to you're smart enough to I'm just saying that giving that real example yeah. mm -hmm. so that they can something really spark because they're inter yeah relatable and like wow I really would love to be able to you know build an airplane I mean it's not out of their reach I know plenty of kids right. who graduated from Hopkins that are doing really amazing things with their lives 
Yes, and for the student who's like, ah, oh, that's not for me, saying this is a, um, increasingly a technology-driven world, you're gonna need to know how to work with people like that. So in my class, you will work with all types and you'll make yourself competitive for that world. Do we have an open house for prospective students? No, we just do step up day. I mean, when students contact the school, they want to shadow. Or <coughs> we invite those families to um, both participate, and we've had uh, over the last four years a pretty significant number of families who have participated in the end of this school year parent meeting in transition, have participated um, for sixth to seventh grade specifically, but then we invite all prospective school choice families to participate in Step Up Day well in advance, and it's a rough estimate, but I would say probably 75% of those families um, participate in the Step Up Day so that the student can get a copy of what their schedule would look like and they go through even before the year begins. So um, Step Up Day has been easier to get um, students to participate because we don't necessarily do prospective programming <clears throat> for incoming families at other grades other than the transition point of six to seven. Another suggestion is um, even before step up day, perhaps to establish an ongoing report, if the students have projects that they're completing, maybe two or three projects throughout the semester or the year, that maybe they're bust over and they do a showcase in the auditorium. And it's, like the elementary school students love every opportunity they ha can get to get into the cafeteria and the World Cafe Day or Immigration Immigration Day or whatever, it, having it be more, I don't know, show and tell. So we have crazy. we did bring the which band went down there last year? Do you remember Brian? Jazz, so we jazz reinstated band. that. Wonderful. The students go and to your <coughs> point, the elementary kids loved it. Right, absolutely loved going in and watching the high schools and middle schoolers perform. So certainly, if there's a way to get students down there, you're right. To, to play back up to sir, perhaps. Maybe <laughs> many, maybe a whole army of sumo wrestlers. Well, well yeah, we, we have two of those suits. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. But I want to say how grateful I am for you as an educator to really care about this issue and take the initiative to design materials that maybe draft one, but at least it gives us something to think about and take action on. I encourage us to take action, measure, is it working? Are we getting more calls? Um, and redirect as needed. Mm -hmm. We have no shortage of ideas mm -hmm. and uh, desire to support you. So I would agree. I think we've batted around some ideas in the past. We've not really been able to necessarily, you know, pull the trigger and get started on some of these things. And you know, we talked about social media platform a couple meetings ago, and you know, trying to get some of that off the ground without going hog wild and you know having too many things out there. But the idea of you know these types of um, information sharing, the idea of testimonials from graduates who you know they don't have to come in here. You could video them talking about you know why Hopkins and what it's done for me, what it's offered to me now that I'm in the working world or I'm in college and succeeding. All of those things digitally, you can make those available, and they all become great tools for you know. Marketing, I know, and selling is kind of a harsh word, but you're trying to share this opportunity with as many people as we can. Yeah. We, we can just try to throw tons of things, and we're not sure what works, but maybe. Oh, and you've isolated, I think you've picked up on some things that are key, you know, highlights that we, that we should be putting out there, and especially strategically, like you said, where we're losing, you know, some grade levels. So, so, so going forward, what, what, what I would like to do is, um, think about putting, they don't necessarily have to be these ads, we can change any of it. I have them in uh, layered format, so they're easy to, to change. Um, and if you guys have any any other ideas of different kinds of ads too, I'd be happy to work on designing that. And I can even run it another test to see if I can get the, uh, the kiddos to make some stuff to put out there. Um, the reward could be wearing the sumo suit with you. There's only <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah, I like that idea. Uh, so I'd like to I'd like to go forward with starting to put something in the paper just to see if you can get anything. I'd like to go forward with um, marketing this uh, kind of stuff to our fifth and sixth grade parents, and uh, I'd like to go forward with um, starting to put together some kind of commercial. Uh, 
uh, promoting the school. Um, and, I, and I'd also, uh, I'll start to plan a hands-on demonstration for uh, when we go over there for the, the shadowing. I, I have s some ideas I work with the robots and uh, there's a battle bot unit where of course they love destroying things and it's an ass up, right. they get. Can you let me know when that happens? So. <laughs> <laughs> well, if there's no questions, like, are we, do we need a vote on this? No. Or just, yeah. Are there any more questions? I'm hearing we're generally supportive of it. Yes, mm -hmm. excited to see. Excited, Very yeah. Cool. Yeah, and like I said, any, if you guys have any suggestions about the ads or any of that kind of stuff, please feel free to, to shoot me an email because the, you know, zero cost to, to change it graphically and all that kind of stuff. Well, thanks a lot for your time. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate yeah. it. That's great. Okay, great. see you tomorrow. Okay. Thanks. That's exciting. Okay, screenagers viewing. So this, it has been in the weekly email a few times, so I'll bring, put it back in the weekly, weekly email. Hopkins Academy will do it screening uh, screenagers, so a documentary about the effect of screen time on young people. It comes with, and how young people are interacting with screens, it comes with teaching resources, and Hopkins has scheduled it. Our goal is that it will stream into every classroom. Teachers will get resources to lead a discussion about screenagers. The students at Hopkins will do that on March 30th. And then there'll be a community screening. We split the cost with Granby Public Schools. So um, there'll be a, a community screening on March 28th. And that will probably happen in Granby. And I will be giving people, families, lots of information about it. Um, and there'll be a discussion after the community screening for parents and community members. They're going to be able to watch it on their iPad. Right <laughs> <laughs> what up on the phone? Right. It's definitely getting a lot more press and attention these days. Mm -hmm. uh, but the Today Show was doing a, a special series on that this week on um, screen time for, t for teenagers and the effects that it has mm -hmm. on their learning, on their attention span, on their social skills. On their parents. On their parents, <laughs> <laughs> on having a conversation with somebody yep. and making eye contact, like all of that. So, it's so really Humera sent a really interesting article about something that has been tested <coughs> in some public schools that allows children to put their phones away and not have access to their phones so. all day long. And I shared it with the Hopkins faculty, and it's sparked a really interesting conversation. Great comments, thread, they're still coming in. Right now. Great, great, yeah. Um, it enables um, students to lock their phone and put it away for the day and have maybe meaningful, screenless conversation. It doesn't eliminate the need for like using computers on wheels and the th kinds of things that we would give them, but it would, um, it would really force them to have conversation mm -hmm. and interaction. And I think that's um, increasingly a lost art. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's sparked. I will update you on that conversation. Uh, have so is that right? something you're considering? Well, I put it out to the faculty and said what, you would be shocked to hear that when I read it, I said, fantastic, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it tomorrow. Um, and so then I sent it out to all of the Hopkins faculty and staff, and um, there are people who have asked some really good questions conceptually. I think everybody has said conceptually, absolutely on board, don't want to see young people interacting as often as they are with their phones. There are some folks who have said, well, um, at what point are we teaching them responsible use of the devices? Or is this really what we should be doing, shouldn't they be using them responsibly? And, and then some very good practical questions. Um, what if a student doesn't want to give up their phone? What if one teacher said to me, there are, st there are students in, in school sometimes who will have almost like a, what do, you, what do you call this? What do they call it, a burn phone or something? Not a real, like a burner? Burner, burner phone yeah. because they're that, secret agents? Well, no, because if the teacher says, give me your phone, that's yeah, the phone they give. Phone. You give them the fake phone. Um, so that this degree that was, um, you know, so there was a good discussion about is this really what we want to do? Of course, I want to do it, but that's not shocking. So there's. And you know, historically, I haven't wanted to do it. Yes, which is why I was ready to seize the day. <laughs> well, 
Well, I, I found that article interesting and, and noticed my framing of the, mm -hmm. um, what I asked you to think about was what would it look like to do a little experiment to conduct a pilot to perhaps lease those pouches, test mm -hmm. them, ask the company to give us some loaner mm -hmm. pouches and try it and, and be more intentional ab about um, initiating the interaction that we want to see because I'm not convinced that without them there would be more interaction necessarily. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, how might we do a more intentional test that gets the outcomes that we think could mm -hmm. happen and see if it's right for us. So no com like long-term commitment yeah. per se. And maybe then there's the opportunity for students who were interested to, to test out life without a phone for a day at school or something like that. No surprise that the words little experiment and pilot completely like they went right by me. Humara, I didn't even see <laughs> that <laughs> words in her email. She <laughs> said, come, in, you know. she's, come over to my side. Well, I mean, in the faculty, end, get on board. <laughs> therein, you might have, you know, less resistance mm -hmm. from all everyone if it's just a little experiment mm -hmm. and it gets better outcomes. If it doesn't, then maybe we shouldn't invest right. in it. Right. So. I also think you, you, can't, you can't avoid the reality um, in these, this day and age, especially like the last week and everything like that. You're going to have a lot of parents that are going to be like, I want my kid to be able to have their phone. Yeah, if something Teachers will, set, will, tell so. you, will tell us that the number one, I mean, certainly in a situation like that, obviously, you want in a, a major catastrophe, we want parents to be able to contact children. The, tr the reality is that teachers will say that the number one interrupter is students saying, can I go out in the hallway? I need to text my parent back. That's parents texting <laughs> during the day. That's, that's number one. Mm -hmm. And then second is probably texting the kid that's in the class, mm -hmm. right in there with them. But I folded the something. notes and just flipping them. It's <laughs> modern day for the kids. Right, exactly. Old school texting. Yeah. Yeah. Kids are very environmentally conscious and they don't want to waste the paper. No, <laughs> that's exactly right. Okay, so we will look forward to screen majors. Uh, Hopkins Academy Program of Studies, Mr. Beck. So it's not as substantive a list of changes. Uh, there are no changes in graduation requirements or anything like that. It's mm -hmm. largely just edits to bring, we changed, switched over to a new <coughs> student information system last year. And with that, uh, at the same time, the state also changed uh, or made adaptations to their course uh, leveling structure. So we just made sure we had alignment. There were a couple of places where I needed to make sure that elective courses were tabbed as O2, which is an indication that they're at the college prep level because O1 for the state is um, effectively remedial courses or uh, courses that are unleveled, <clears throat> like a, a study skills course or something like that, where there isn't a a curriculum in advance. There are a couple of additional uh, courses that are suggested. AP World History, I think, will be uh, the 11th um, advanced placement course that we'll have in our program of studies, if I'm not mistaken. So for a school our size from uh, eight years ago, we went from offering four advanced placement courses, and I think it really testifies to the um, the dedication of our faculty, the interest of our students and families, and, and the change in our um, in the updating, really, uh, by Ms. Cullinan of our <clears throat> um, guidance program to reflect what colleges really look for, which is more challenging coursework. Uh, and uh, that being the top criteria that they look for, um, I think teachers did a phenomenal job of looking through and making some minor modifications to things, making a couple of recommendations for new courses, and then in science, um, just adding some uh, language to their course descriptions for Science 7 and Science 8, um, which used to be Bioscience 7 and Physical Science 8, where they were focused in those particular um, subfields of science. They're uh, now um, biology, chemistry, and physics, uh, as well as environmental science, are woven through uh, the curriculum up in through the middle school years before courses become discrete at the high school level. So those course uh, descriptions needed to change and that's a result of the work that was done by um, the science department and uh, those teachers from the elementary school um, from grades, I believe grades four on up to vertically align the science curriculum. And so, you know, very good work on their part and, and the curriculum is being finished for grade eight by 
uh, Katie Gallagher right now, so that, that uh, will be updated this year, and we should be completed at that particular point. We'll need to write a curriculum for world history, uh, but Mr. Um, Burns uh, works with the College Board and has access to um, not just <clears throat> you know hundreds of syllabi from across the country, but also to the curriculum, um, various curricula uh, himself. So it's not something where he'll have to necessarily recreate the wheel from scratch. So um, that's basically it. There's not a lot in there in terms of, as I said, substantive changes. It's largely um, just the addition of a couple new courses, a couple of course descriptions, and um, just some updating to course leveling and um, you know some language to reflect our practice um, you know, in graduation planning. To consolidate some of the language that's in there. Two questions. Um, what was the name of the group that uh, came and evaluated? Was it NIAS? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So one was I wasn't. I can't remember if we had received the results of all of their. They will be the March twenty sixth. The report will be for the March twenty sixth. The March, the March school committee meeting will have the NIAS report. Okay. okay. Uh, so the second part of the question is, do you anticipate in that report receiving any feedback that would impact this um, program of studies as to either that would need to be implemented right away, or is this a more longer term? I'm just thinking of some of the questions that they asked well, us. Great questions, and I understand the report has already been received and in-house and that you're digesting mm -hmm. it and already taking action, so mm -hmm. I imagine it is probably reflected in here. Um, I'm not sure what kind of questions you were asked per se, but um, so if you wanted to share those, uh, you know, I know that when I look through um, in the first edit that I do with the chair, that you know, the, we received really broad credit for opening up our upper level coursework to every student in the school, and to not have those arbitrary restrictions that many schools have in place that, you know. Schools will say, "Well, you need if a parent approves you being and well, that doesn't serve well uh, a student who doesn't have a strongly advocating parent or comes from a challenging socioeconomic background." Um, so our faculty opened those courses up to everybody, and I believe they go out and actively recruit students who may even be on the cusp to say, "Come on, you know, join us in our AP classes." And at the same time, not teaching that course to the middle, but pulling those students up to where they need to be in terms of that level of rigor. And so we did. We received a pretty significant amount of credit for that. There was. Um, I didn't see anything uh, directly related to uh, the program of studies and the course of studies itself in my review um, that warranted any recommendations. It had most of the recommendations in curriculum that they would come in standard two in curriculum and standard seven in providing the resources to support that curriculum. Mm -hmm. um, standard seven is the place where we probably get the most um, commendations. <clears throat> and in standard two, we know that we just we need to get our uh, our academic expectations, uh, school-wide academic expectations, wrapped up and integrated into our curriculum templates. Um, and so it has more to do with the way that the curriculum documents themselves are used uh, by the teachers um, and by us in terms of our analysis than it does the program of studies itself. So. Okay. That's helpful to know because I think I was mixing the two as a, you know, did they identify, oh, this is a gap as opposed mm -hmm. to this is how we'd like to see you implement it within the curriculum. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, and I'm not sure, again, what, what questions they ask. Obviously, the teams come from all over the place and every team has a, a different tenor um, in terms of coming in. Uh, well, they asked a broad range for. that was, you know, dependent on their area of um, oversight within that Yep, group. and they probably stuck um, largely to the writing guides They did. As yeah, well, they did. So. But I was also just thinking about the students and how well, you know, they talked about um, their experiences and whether there was any, you know, the outcome from that that is directly related to the program of study. Like, Nothing. we don't have this program, or we do have this program. Mm -hmm. and whether we were kind of thinking of needing to emphasize something, add something, or shift based on that. Yeah, I didn't see anything in there that indicated that we had um, any kind of substantial gaps in, in what it is that we offer uh, for courses for students. And I think part of that probably has to do with the fact that we broadly supplement with virtual high school in areas of interest and you know not being able to offer 
advanced placement statistics as an example or offer a course in, you know, if a student wants to take a course in the Holocaust, we make that available to juniors and seniors um, through virtual high school uh, as part of our contracting with them. So um, that may supplant, you know, that, um, you know, it, it provides a great supplement to what we offer in the program of studies. So. That may be another future advertising <coughs> topic. <laughs> yes. Course of study and virtual, you know, mm -hmm. the broad range that's available through the, the online courses. Mm -hmm. So, this does require a motion from the school committee. Are there any other questions or feedback on the program of study? Okay. Can I get a motion? Motion to approve the program of study. I'll second it. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Approved. Thank you. Thank you. This is the earliest we've had it approved. <coughs> so it, what, what we're hoping to be able to do is have our um, students and parents register for courses through the community portal. And so Jennifer Mendelson, um, my administrative assistant, went to uh, training um, the week before the vacation. And uh, she's going to be training us to hopefully set that up. Worst case scenario, we'll do it as we have in the past. But we're hopeful that by the time we hit the end of March, um, that we're sending out communications and some directions around working at home uh, with students. Angie Cullinan has met with every graduating class of students in the school to provide them with an overview of uh, courses that they should be looking at at their grade level, depending on what it is that they're looking to do after high school. So our you know, fully implemented comprehensive guidance curriculum has prevented us from needing to do a, an entirely separate set of individual grade level meetings with students, with the exception, of course, of the sixth grade coming in. Um, where we'll have a couple of conversations. But we're going to schedule that this year much earlier than we have in the past, which will be helpful. Great. That's great news. Now, I know the <coughs> use of the portal to do this is a first-time thing, but is it also a first-time thing that parents might be involved in the decision-making around? No, that's, um, we've opened that up in terms of sending out the, the Naviance information, but that was largely contingent upon whether or not a student carried home their, or opened up their <coughs> password and yeah. their email to share right. with their families. I never saw <laughs> yeah. So, um, so in this particular case, the communication will go out to students through our email system as well as to parents through the school brain system okay. to say, you know, this use your password, use your login. I'm sure we'll get a couple of inquiries from parents saying, I don't remember my login and password. Right. Um, so we can resend easily enough. Um, and it doesn't require parents to go in. It just enables them to be able to go in um, and to be able to consult with their kids. On, on what it is that they want their kids to register for, you know, and it becomes, you know, more important as students move up in, in through the high school years, whereas in the middle school years, it's largely making some choices between some electives, but the program is, it, um, you know, we're a very heterogeneous school, um, which has uh, substantial advantages in terms of getting everybody prepared for a particular level of study. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, principal search. And a great visit. We have two finalists for the Hadley Elementary School principal. And there was a community night. Today I did a site visit to Bow Elementary, where one of our finalists is the vice principal. And tomorrow I'll be at Plains <coughs> Elementary, where one of our finalists is working as an interim building administrator. And then on Thursday, both finalists will come to Hadley Elementary School, and teachers have been given the chance to sign up. And this is specifically for faculty and staff to interact with the two candidates. And um, we will then also, as part of the site visit process, I meet in person with a good number of the references that are included in somebody's packet in addition to other people that I asked to speak with, curriculum folks and special educators and other folks to try to get a full sense of the finalists skills and their interaction style with different groups. So it was a great visit today. I'm looking forward to my visit tomorrow. And we're hoping to have this wrapped up next week. Great. That's great. great. Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> there. Okay. All right. Fiscal year 19, choice charter and vocational projections. So embedded in all the graphs, there are some data that require a vote. That has mm -hmm. to do with school choice slots. Uh, these are 
these are questions that come up pretty routinely. You've seen them in the charter report. You've seen them in the choice report. They sometimes come up from select board, from finance committee. So I wanted you to have all the graphs and all the numbers split up a gazillion different ways, like choice in general, choice by grade level, choice by grade. The same thing with charter. When are students leaving? Where are they going? So again, some of that information is redundant, um, but you, you have this, and certainly you can ask me any questions that you would like. And these are data that we would also um, make available to uh, finance subcommittee and to select board when those questions come up as well. The first one shows you CTE's Career and Technical Education Chapter 74 approved programs. Um, and you see we have seen this pretty substantial spike over the last two years of students electing Career and Technical Chapter 74 education. Um, so from 24 in FY17 to 30 in FY18, and um, 37 is uh, all the information we have now. So that takes into consideration we take out the seniors plus new app applications, and as of a couple of weeks ago, right for the packet was put together, 37 was our number. Can you explain that? It just I'm sorry, CTE enrollment within or outside of? Outside. So CTE, Career and Technical Education, I mean Chapter 74 approved programming. So that means Smith Vocational. If Smith Vocational okay. didn't have the program they were looking for, then it might be another Chapter 74 approved school. But um, that's what that is. I have a question, um, just mainly because of that huge spike. Is there any follow-up follow up with the um, families of the, the students that go to a CTE school? Um, like any form of conversation or survey or anything like that to try to figure out, like, try to get out <coughs> by? Um, yeah, so I believe with, like, that Ms. Cullinan that and Brian, and Mr. Beck, you can help me with this, but when they apply, the student has to fill out an application. The application goes to the guidance counselor at Hopkins Academy, and then eventually it comes over to me for signature. Um, and uh, Ms. Cullinan, the guidance counselor, speaks with the students about why they've selected it. And to my knowledge, you can certainly add to this, most students are pretty specific about the kind of career training that they want. So they know, I want to be a carpenter, I want to be a mechanic, I want to be, in this case, we have one of, there's only one other, I think, agricultural high school in the entire Commonwealth. I think there's only one other. There's not more than two. There are more than three in the entire Commonwealth. We might be one of two. So um, I want to go into animal husbandry. So they're very specific about they, what they want to do. They're required to go through exploratory, but they all have very specific career paths that they say. They want and many to of the students, we have an idea actually when they come in, you know, within the first couple of months that they're here in school, um, as we have conversations and meetings with families to get to know students and their families as they enter school, um, that many of the students who apply um, have uh, a family influence or um, background that mm -hmm. um, we begin to understand very early on that these are students who are looking for it early uh, mm -hmm. in the process as opposed to being in a situation where a kid is making a decision, you know, partway through eighth grade, maybe, I don't know. These aren't kids who are on the fence. They've made the commitment pretty early on in their educational career, and it's largely family-based decision-making, so. That is true. We have a lot of families who are generationally, yep. folks have gone to Smith. We had a student come back this year who was in yep. uh, uh, Chapter 74, and he decided he wanted to come back to Hopkins. Mm -hmm. It's unusual, but it does happen. Yeah, I was just curious if there's any change in trends that could account for, like, that spike of 13 years. I think in general that vocational education has has done a great job. I would say this, I was aware of this when I was superintendent of a folk school, that they've done a much better job of marketing vocational and technical education. So how it is talked about in public policy, how the governor talks about it, um, how the previous governor talked about it, has really changed over the years. Like it, it's, it, it's not how vocational education was described when I was in school, or even 10 years ago, how it was described. Um, they've done a very, very good job of uh, marketing the fact that it is um, technical education. And it isn't just marketing. It's also the sort of reflecting what the needs of the industry are yeah. around robotics and manufacturing. Mm -hmm. It's a lost art. We need to retool American society to be able to do the kinds of things that 
our government recognizes needs to will stimulate the economy. It's, so absolutely, absolutely, Humera. Right. I mean, a lot of these jobs are things that you'll often hear. I was lumping into marketing, but you're right. It's how, you know, the CTE has done a very good job of linking itself to um, market demand and the kinds of jobs that are likely to be outsourced and those that aren't. Right. So you always hear CTE people say, "Can't outsource your plumber." Right. And you also can't call a call center and say, "Walk me through this." Most people don't want to. Right. So that's that's some of it too. But linking our educational opportunities to those same mm -hmm. career opportunities are, is our great opportunity. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So if I look through the, one of the next slides, uh, mm -hmm. of school choice enrollment trends, 13 to 19, mm -hmm. we're still uh, net positive by... We are. Of course, if you add it, if you've lumped in uh, charter and choice as one bucket, that would look different. But um, I do purposefully, one school choice is treated completely differently than um, career and technical education and charter schools. It's, the numbers are different, we fill out different reports. Um, so yes, we certainly still have more students who are choicing in versus students who are choicing out. The numbers for FY19, all that happens here is this backs out, um, you have nine <coughs> seniors right now choicing in, so they're taken out, and you have eight seniors choicing out, and it doesn't assume any other changes. So we have had 13 queries at Hopkins. We've had uh, additional queries at HES. We have the exact number of how many families have indicated their interest in applying for choice. So that this is really a complete guess in FY19. If you're, t if you're looking at these numbers, and you're talking about the total amount out, um, including school choice and CCE, we're at a net loss of 14. Oh, and then charter, yeah. Right. So overall, right. yeah. Where, where can you just, is there one graph that has all those numbers? No, I didn't put one on one graph, but that could. So seem. what are the different categories? I'm sorry. <coughs> Excuse me. School choice, mm -hmm. chapter 74, CTE, and charter. Right. So your choice out um, right now in FY18 is 55. Your Smith Voke out um, in FY18 is 30, 55, 30, and your charter out, I think, right now is 47. Let me check that. Is it 47? I got one of these. Yeah, it is uh, 47. Seats yeah, I, it's what's well, one thing we have to do is yeah. uh, certainly, and that's embedded in there. They all go through the recommendations for school choice seats, but it really was in response. Tara, I think last meeting you might have had some questions very specifically about by grade where Two students were leading there, yeah. around choice, yeah. and it is a question that can often come up, as I said, with the select board with finance committee, and I know that you all interact with those folks too, so. I wanted you to have the information about what's happening. And certainly it's information, as you can see, that the faculty has been looking at and trying to brainstorm and problem solve around what makes sense. And so we're looking, uh, you have embedded in that right after the school choice graphs, the 2018-2019 uh, school choice uh, seats available. I do want to make one correction. So nothing different with the slots available. What you would be voting is uh, a total of 83 slots. Mm -hmm. um, for the district in school choice um, with slots by grade level as indicated here. It says on your current grade enrollments, current K enrollment is 50. I think I was just having this crazy moment of wishful thinking. It's uh, 26, <coughs> but you know, a girl can dream. Uh, <laughs> that's what current K is, 26. Everything else is correct on that. So can I ask a question sure. about um, grade five? Is that the one that we had added a class, or is this at this point now just, it's three classes? Four. That was four, four. Five. 
Okay, so but for this coming year, is that the same grade that's now moving? It's going to become plus. three classes, forty-six total students. Correct. And we had we had talked about whether in adding a class, we said we're not going to open up any school choice slots, even though it's an average of we're talking fifteen mm -hmm. kids per classroom. And so the feeling of the HES. Faculty, it's still a one-year position because you also have three sixth grades right now, so that position won't be in the budget in FY19. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a recommendation of the Hadley Elementary faculty and the administration that we don't, we still don't open school choice slots. That grade is benefiting greatly from the small class size. Okay. That was certainly something that they needed. Sounds good. So as far as school choice seats, so we need to. Um, decide if we'll approve the 83 slots. Are there mm -hmm. any questions about how those are allocated in terms of um, HES or Hopkins? I was just trying to figure out how they're determined by grade. Is there some formula or is it more subjective? It's more subjective. I mean, there is a general sense of uh, classes. They, they certainly had the elementary school, uh, one of our things that we mark it on is that we do have small class sizes, but really, Paul, it's, there isn't a formula. It's looking at class composition, it's a look at student needs, and then they make recommendations based on that. So I have a question around um, grade two in particular. Mm -hmm. I think um, historically I've observed that two is a very interesting um, year mm -hmm. where students are going from like one wing and a certain kind of education to stepping up to a whole other mm -hmm. wing and a different kind yep. of um, course of study. Um, I noticed that we're potentially opening up six slots. Up. I'm wondering if there's any uh, concern about um, the size of those classes. Um, and They're uh, anticipating a couple of move outs there. That was part of the reason for opening up okay. that many seats. Yeah. So it'll be at the same number then, the same level? It might be slightly larger. The teachers also weigh in, the administration, so Dr. Wickman doesn't do this in isolation. She speaks with the current grade level teachers. Um, so we're talking grade two next year. She talks with current grade one and says, what do you think makes sense? So they've weighed in and then they anticipate, as I said, at least a couple of move outs. Now, um, in a perfect world, if, um we fill each slot available, like let's say in grade two, but then um, as that class matriculates through, it's determined that maybe that is too many students. Mm -hmm. What is the re what is the recourse at that point? Uh, you open up another classroom. One school choice, always school choice. Cool. Thank you. So you can't. It's an excellent question. You can't rescind the school choice offer, and Hadley. Public schools has, since I've been here, and apparently historically, if a student is a Hadley student, Hadley Public Schools is always given them the option of remaining a Hadley student. So if a family moves, um, we don't make them wait for the lottery, and there's that's perfectly legal. We've checked with legal counsel. So if a family moves and says, "I'd like, we'd like our children to stay here," we just re reclassify them as choice. What were our slots open last year? Like, how do they vary total number last year? I don't know off the top of my head. I'd have to pull the, um, I don't have that. They have a general idea of like the percentage of slots filled potentially to open. I, I know I'm asking a specific number last year. Yeah, so the elementary slots typically get just about, just about all of them get just all full. Um, it, not so much because we have so many more slots at the high school, right. and in secondary, that there's much more <laughs> competition. So a lot of students will decide that, um, so you have PVPA, you, you just have more competition mm -hmm. in high school and you have uh, career tech ed too. Does the, um, the chart on the previous page give you that info? It tells you by grade last year. Oh, oh, it doesn't tell us seats in. though. No, yeah. it doesn't. It, it just yeah. gives you an idea of um, which grades, grade For levels had the higher choice in and I distributed it across right. K through 12. But what I don't know is if this is what we It wasn't all last year. So in other words, they're carrying over. Do you know what I mean? I so was, they're not brand new seats yep. in FY18. All those seats were brand new students. Just one more question. Sure. So 
I just want to make sure I'm understanding. In grade one for next year, we're going to have six slots open, and the current grade K enrollment is 50? No, that's why I was missing that. Oh, I thought, that okay, I thought that was the above. Oh, yeah. no. Sorry for misunderstanding. And we don't know yet for... Because we don't have the census. The census yet. back yet. Correct. Okay. It's just a motion to determine whether we want to approve the 83 slots as mm -hmm. distributed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I make a motion to do so. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Okay. okay. So that's approved. Um, so that was an action item. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so item uh, FY19 budget update. Is that? Correct. Are we ready to move on? Okay. Yeah, so we'll take you through what we think is pretty good news for this stage in the game. Remember, you're not voting on budget tonight. There's a specific reason why what, what you're looking at right now is what um, I'm suggesting that I and Heather, if she's available, bring before finance subcommittee, and I think that that is scheduled March for March 6th. 6th. Yes, I didn't I available. I get a confirmation from David Nixon, but I'm going to assume it is. So we are purposefully trying to wait to have a line item version of the budget. So we have fewer of those floating around that are draft, draft, draft. As Chris and I will jokingly say, we probably, between the two of us, already have 15 drafts for FY19 um, easily. easily. <laughs> yeah. uh, so we, as it, the more gets nailed down, then it's, it's just easier that we're not creating draft after draft of things that are going to change. Why we feel like it's pretty good news at this stage in the game, although things could change, is you see total budget expenses from FY18 to FY19, and um, with a total budget increase of uh, uh, roughly $104,000, so a 1.24% increase, and that does take into consideration all settled contracts. Wow. Um, that, that is a wow for yeah, a public right. school amazing. district. It definitely is. Um, now you see that the <laughs> local contribution does get hit harder because as you notice, we see a decrease in circuit breaker, we see a decrease in the 240 grant, um, school choice. applying less school choice because there were some things last year when we approved FY18 like the additional teacher. Those were school, things we said we were going to fund through school choice. We're not applying as much school choice. Um, uh, and pre-K revolving didn't go down. 391, that's a grant that's getting phased out. So you see some decreases in grant revenue, yeah. and therefore the increase on the local contribution is, um, and also any increase is going to be a greater percentage increase because it's a smaller number on local contribution. But that still is, um, that, that still is not a, an alarming number. So that's 100, right now it's looking like roughly $158,000 as of today for an increase in local contribution, but we will drive home to the finance subcommittee that there are a lot of moving parts. There's still a lot of moving parts. So if you go down to the circuit breaker projections, the larger graph, right, um, is, assumes a 65% reimbursement for circuit breaker. But to the right, you see if the legislature were to fund at 75%, that would be roughly an additional $30,000, $29,000 in revenue. Um, you see our school choice projections. Mm -hmm. We base these school choice projections on that number you see in your graph where I said we took out the seniors and um, we took out the seniors in the equation, that's it. So as I mentioned to you, there's 13 queries for um, school choice. And if you assume that um, those students don't have any, um, we don't get any special education increment for those students, uh, you're looking at $50,000, $75,000, right, in additional school choice funds for if, if all those students were to come. Um, what we do know are our collective bargaining agreements settled through FY21. Remember, in some cases they look different in FY19 because there was some um, wage 
restructuring where people were well below the regional averages. We do know that we have one teacher retiring. There could be other personnel changes before the end of the year that could positively or negatively impact the budget, but they could positively. Um, so what we don't know, uh, that Title IIA may be discontinued. That would be a $13,000 decrease in revenue, and that would increase the local contribution. Those circuit breaker estimates that we talked about. Um, so the cost estimates in special education, those are all based on current IEPs and any information we have right now about likely placement changes right now. Now, we don't know what may change in terms of team meetings. Um, we don't know if any student moves into the district prior to April 1st. I mean, up to the last day of March, no matter what the placement cost is, if they move before April 1st, where they land absorbs all the cost in the budget. Um, similarly, if they move after April 1st, you hold on to the expense for an entire year after that. Um, and um, if students are in the custody of the Department of Children and Families, if students are in DCF custody, DCF has the authority to uh, make unilateral placement decisions without consulting a team or the school district. And um, you can notice there are some districts that have a huge set of expenses associated with that. So. Those are the kinds of things that could change. Uh, school choice, this is something that really doesn't factor as much into revenues and expenses. School choice out doesn't come out of the school department budget, but it is something that certainly comes up. You've seen it on the cherry sheet, at select board, at tri board, and at finance subcommittee. So we talked a little bit about the cherry sheet last time. Those are just estimates. So that, again, if, if the seniors graduate and no additional students choice out, those are big ifs, that number could be as low as 265-130. Um, that's important on the town side. I've had this conversation with, with David, and I'll reiterate it to the Finance Subcommittee. It's certainly not on me to, to um, tell them how to make decisions, but it is important for them before they make any sort of draconian type of cuts to know that these numbers, a lot could change in these numbers, right? So they, I know that there was a lot of conversation. Some of you saw that in that email, ouch, look at the cherry sheet. I wouldn't want people to rush in and start making huge cuts around the cherry sheet. They're just estimates and they're somewhat, I understand where they come from, but even the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education will say they're a little bit pulled out of thin air. Uh, the in receiving revenues, the same thing, um, and um, the charter tuitions, which this is a town expense, but again, this is because the conversation that you'll hear, which is completely logical, is because um, there may be expenses or a desire to um, a desire to build up services in the town, and then this fear about some of these expenses. We just need to be careful um, because the the estimate listed for next year, that's seven six nine six seven four, and I, I actually have an email from the Department of Ed that says, you know, it's really not tied to anything. Um, so, uh, <laughs> so I, I've given you. Um, I, I mean, I think they look at. I, I think I shouldn't. That was their words of saying it. they couldn't point me back to an Excel spreadsheet. Every one of these other numbers, I can go right to an Excel spreadsheet. I don't include those in here because they have student names and identifying student information, but I have Excel spreadsheets. We have Excel spreadsheets for all these choice things currently in FY18. They're very precise and exact. When you go to Charter FY19, I do think the department or perhaps the, the governor's office says, well, there's been this steady increase, so it's logical to assume there'll be another increase like the ones they've seen. So that it's not completely made up, but it's not tied to any specific census. It's a somewhat logical it's guess. Yeah, it, it, that's a perfect way of putting it, a logical guess. A little somewhat. Um, so, <laughs> um, so then you see that if... Can I just ask yeah. though, Annie, when they tell us our final numbers, do they have to have a backing or can they just make something up as well? No, they always have a backing. So the reason, if you go to the very last paragraph, FY18 charter enrollments, this is from a worksheet called Q2, Q2 Charter Enrollment mm -hmm. that we get from the department. It's in the security portal because it has identifying information. So we can see exactly who is on it. Okay. Um, 
And we also ask charter schools to tell us every single child that you claim belongs to Hadley and their street address because we don't want to have issues that some other districts have had with mm -hmm. charges and going awry. So FY18 charter enrollments, this is actual quarter two. It, this includes four seniors and those four seniors who are in charter enrollments are costing the town $64,000 for those four students. Um, if those students were to graduate, no additional students enrolled in charter, the FY19 net cost estimate would be 512000 or 513000 which is a far cry from 769674. Right. And for some of the monies that the town is looking for, that's what I say, of just it's early in the process, so just there's a lot of wait and see that can happen. Smith Vogue is under which category? Um, Smith Vogue is not listed anywhere on here, but Smith Vogue's projected tuition for next year is just under 600. Do you know? I can Stop tell you exact you in a few seconds. I'm just curious how much. So if I took for the charter tuitions, for example, I, I divided the 575,526 that says we net spend divided by the 47. Students, so that's a little over 12,000 students. Mm -hmm. And that varies, does it? It does vary. So look at, you can tell that by four seniors. Four yeah. seniors at a cost so of there's $16,000 a piece. Well, uh, it depends. So in that charter report I gave you, it showed you that snapshot yeah. of different, depending on a student's program, that's the cost associated. Right. So in one case, we have a tuition that's $21,000 for a charter school, gotcha. a single tuition just under 21,000. So it, it depends on the charter school and it depends on the student. So to Paul's point though, um, it's not just charter tuitions that are unknown, it's also the chapter 74 CTE yeah, so tuition that is unknown. We have budgeted, we are assuming $634,000 based on the 37. So what we don't know, we assume the tuition hadn't isn't going to change. There's nothing indicating rate restructuring. So we budgeted it at an FY18 tuition, and we also assumed we always have to make an assumption about the special education costs because you get a surcharge for students who have an individual education plan right. who go to Vogue schools. So to estimate that. So is it worth broadening that um, category to be yep. charter and CTE? Charter yes, CTE I can add to this before we go to. Um, yeah, just to, yeah. I mean, because we've always historically said tuitions is an unknown and we've been hit in the past with right. large increases yeah. so maybe bundling that all together would be helpful yep. and I'm thrilled to see the collective bargaining our agreements all on here because that's awesome that these are all yeah. settled for at least the next three years that we know going in yeah. new plan. So, I mean, we're hoping the news will continue to improve. I don't think this is, this is actually a very good position to be in this early on. If nothing changed and you're talking a total operating increase of 1.24, um, that's certainly nothing to be embarrassed about, particularly uh, given the fact that all contracts are settled again. Yep. Um, things could change for the positive and hopefully they don't change for the negative. We'll add the, the CT information. Is there anything else that you think we should add for finance committee? Uh, well, what are the messages we want to convey to them? That like they're small and increase, really, you know, sort of we're managing their budget well. Um, you know, they're going to ask, well, how did you keep your rate of increase below inflation? It cuts, um, not backfilling. How is it that it's such a small increase? Uh, we had uh, one retirement that resulted in a pretty substantial savings. Um, Let's see what else. Actually, just a couple of, of movements in the, um, I forgot the name we called them. It used to be Paris. Yes, oh. <laughs> yes thank yeah. you. Um, that, you know, again, we have higher paid ones leave, lower mm -hmm. priced ones come on board. Um, so we have that as well. Um, trying to look at things that came out in the negative on the, on the budget. As it stands now. For yeah. big numbers. A lot of small ones, but. Mm -hmm. uh, the NEASC, um, 
cost that was about twenty thousand dollars that obviously we won't need this year um, and it, it also helped I would say that our bargaining unit we say below the rate of inflation too actually for a the largest bargaining unit technically the rate of inflation is about 1.6 and it's, you know, so it's the largest unit has an increase a cola that's less than that yep some textbook accounts that you know, again, won't be utilized this year that were last year. Um. So we're managing our budget tightly. Really, the increase you'll see is due to a decrease of state dollars, state and federal dollars. Right. So as these revenues go down, that's always the challenge. Right. And I did ask the question that was brought up last time. Paul, you'd asked, is this new money, the Special Education Stabilization Fund, I'm thinking of it now as I look at this. Is this new money? And I asked that question when I was at Tri board, I think. And David stated that at this point he was thinking that it would just be a transfer of money that's in an existing, the existing stabilization count and creating a new stabilization count account on the town side. But the existing stabilization count is the one that we have here in the school no, budget? The or town the town's? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. On the town side. So they're offering to carve out a new account using town funds to populate Yes, dollars. so what I put in your packet last time yeah. was what David presented to Tri-Board at the last Tri-Board meeting, and um, they didn't have a long, in-depth conversation about it. So I don't want to say that. I think David has proposed this for consideration. I can't tell you what the select board's opinion is on it right now. And it wasn't discussed in detail. Just as I had included in your packet, he included it in the packet for the select board, and they they didn't go into any great discussion about it. So I don't have a sense of how the, the opinions of each of the board members are at what the recommendations would be. Okay. Okay. So there's no action on this, but this is no. It was just the moving forward. Yeah, the, giving um, the feedback to include the CTE information, yeah. Paul. I do think it is that the the. I think this represents good management of funds, and we're trying to address the things, as you saw earlier this evening, we're, we're actively attempting to turn things around in terms of choice. And even uh, chartered Northampton Public, <coughs> Northampton School Committee is meeting tomorrow, but um, we are looking to move ahead with the idea that I mentioned to you that we may also be able to collaborate with Northampton around it on being able to allow students with their who have studied Chinese to maintain their language fluency by using technology to participate in courses surrounding campuses that have been able to add Chinese. Great. Thank you. Sure. All right, thanks. Okay, uh, last presentation discussion item, feedback, informative evaluation, superintendent. So you have in the packet here um, Annie's uh, goals, which we had discussed at our previous meeting um, as being linked from coming out of your evaluation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And those are uh, tied to the standards of effective practice that you see here, standards one through four. Um, so really it's a question of if there's any um, comments or feedback on these goals for moving forward in terms of implementing them. Yeah, and also it's so not changing the goals, it's really what would be helpful to me. I don't, I don't need or require any sort of formal um, vote or any sort of formal vote, but um, any any discussion of my professional competence or performance always has to be done publicly and in an open session. I, I don't know, unless you're really getting ready to uh, take me to the bullshit. Then there's a whole bunch of other rules for that. But general, uh, general conversation about performance and performance evaluation always has to be done in open session and in public. And so my question would simply be, if you have any questions about if I am, or what sort of progress is being made on these goals, or if you have any concerns, I, I would love to hear them. Um, and some of these, um, 
For example, pressure, the first goal, the kinds of things that we discussed me doing, actively participating in town department meetings, that's continuing, uh, collaborating with all town departments. That has been ongoing all year. Um, I have participated in all of the professional groups that you see listed there. Um, the updating and revising our district strategy and action plan. So you have right now school improvement plans that are aligned to the existing strategy document and we're looking to have a retreat in which you build a new three-year plan. Um, we are doing a lot of work around um, student achievement and student progress data. You've seen a lot of that data that's come before you. Um, and uh, we are revising the curriculum in middle school mathematics. You saw that that's also on Brian's school improvement plan. And um, we're continuing to work on elementary writing. The makerspace models, we've done a very fine job of integrating those at Hadley Elementary. And as you've seen in Sir Simmons class, and we also have somebody from the University of Massachusetts coming in to do professional development on April 10th with Hopkins Academy faculty on 3D printing. Uh, you've seen Dibbles and FAST data. Um, we have been actively participating in CES social justice initiatives. They've asked me to present at their social justice conference on March 10th. That's coming up. And um, the key enhancements to improve family and community engagement. Um, so I've met with both chiefs, chief of police and the fire chief. Um, and some graduate students at UMass Amherst in nursing are helping us get our planning underway for um, a parent and community forum around how do we help our students, our kids be resilient, how do we keep them safe, how do we identify risks and threats and mitigate those and promote resiliency. Um, and the school committee development and administration of the family and community survey, I guess just after I touch on goal five, I'll circle back to that. Um, goal five also brings data, uh, refers to data, and as I've said, I participate in data team meetings and we are doing a lot of work with data. Um, James Levine and Associates has done a year-long program on trauma-informed instruction and interventions for interested faculty. We've had a lot of faculty participate in that. Um, we did complete the NIAS self-study, and we have uh, monthly coaching and supervision for mental health and behavioral support staff through Jim Levine and Associates, and uh, just had a data and curriculum planning meeting with Hadley Elementary educators today after school with our K-1 educators. Uh, the community survey is something that typically, I say supporting you all, this is something the school committee has done every other year, and I did put Humera and Heather, I think I connected you to uh, the co-chair of CPAC because they also are interested in collecting some data. So anything that I can do to be of assistance, I'm happy to do that if the school committee wants to go ahead and do a family and community survey again this year. Yeah, so I'm wondering if um, after this meeting, what I can do is ask each of you to reach out to me individually if you're interested in being part of that group of usually two so we don't have a quorum. Um, it's oftentimes taking the last year's, last survey that we did, reviewing it um, as kind of a first pass through with any suggested additional questions, either coming from the connection to um, CPAC or mm -hmm. current, you know, more current questions that might be more relevant topics to add, mm -hmm. and calling it back if we feel like there's any kind of duplication because we don't want survey fatigue. Um, getting that read through and approved here and then just having really a timeline of uh, getting it out the door and I think in the past we've had a parent volunteer to help crunch some of the data and interpret it. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. uh, and finding that parent volunteer is a part of the task. Yes. To, yeah. to individuals. Appointing. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Recommending a parent to volunteer right. to, to uh -huh. help us. Uh, but yeah, it's always a good opportunity to get kind of a pulse of, you know, how folks are feeling. Um, the open response questions are usually, um, you know, very helpful in very interpreting. Insightful. Yeah, it kind of where, what what's on people's minds in terms of um, the different open response, not just the scale of mm -hmm. um, 
uh, survey questions. So I'll do that. I'll send out. Um, so individually, you can let me know. Then we can assemble our two people um, and talk about the reality of getting it done before the end of the school year. That sounds great. Okay. Um, how, um, when do would we need to have it in order for it to make a um, fa be factored into our um, goals revision process and so the retreat evaluation process and all of those timing of those things? So. Realistically, I would say that we're likely to get the retreat sorted out closer to the end of the school year or the close of the school year. So you think of yourself as having to the end of the school year. That's your window to get feedback from parents. So maybe we aim for results in the end of May or June. Right. But at least we're not we're not starting from scratch here. We've got uh, two prior uh, yes. robust surveys, and I think if anything, it's a matter of scaling it back potentially yeah um, and yeah, because there were a lot of questions and making sure that we've attended to anything new and emerging that needs to be added yes I think it is really doable I do think that you have great questions and when you said about scaling it back I do recall the feedback uh, several of the questions parents kind of said because mm, you modeled it on the conditions for uh, school effectiveness the CSE right. indicators those are great indicators a lot of those questions have to do with classroom instruction curriculum things that some parents said, I have no idea, right? Yeah. right? I just, I couldn't tell you. Right. I mean, it, it, and um, to, to see that the state even values that, mm -hmm. because what mechanisms are there for parents to learn right. uh, the details of Common Core and what happens right. in the classroom. Um, so that first year, our survey was pretty enormous. Mm -hmm. And the second year scaled up back substantially. And this year, we have the opportunity, the great opportunity to scale it back mm -hmm. even more. Great. One other question that's prompted me to um, think about was when we met with police and fire um, a while back mm -hmm. about having an executive session mm -hmm. to go over their safety items and priorities. Mm -hmm. What's the time? Yeah, so on? our initial plan had been that that was actually going to happen this mm -hmm. at this meeting here. Um, we Some other things have kind of gotten their attention. So I anticipate they will be here in March, but we met with them. And so to give to bring you up to speed on what their recommendations were, we just need to do that in executive session because they're school and safety. But we right. have already met with them and we have progress on we prioritize things and there are many things that are completed. Okay. So but should we think about planning on that for March? Yes. Meeting with yeah. Them? Okay. I just great. Yeah, I just had to move it. And so Annie for the uh, report and you just get thanks for making sure we said the word dipples. Yeah, I t that was for you. So <laughs> <laughs> I was afraid we'd go the whole evening. <laughs> That's the best quote. And if we're not using dibbles next year, I'll still refer back Thank to you. <laughs> I remember when we used to. Um. Okay. All right. That's everything for our presentations mm -hmm. and discussions. Uh, personnel report. You have that in your packet. There's very little to report. Yeah. A resignation, a, re a new hire for that same position, and a couple of long-term subs. Okay. Public comment. <laughs> Crickets. All right, business manager report, including your additional item on pre-K tuition, Chris. Okay. Um, actually, before we do that, I just wanted to let you know that the air conditioning um, bids, we have two already in Yay. for the electrical part of it. Um, they're not due until Wednesday of next week, and then the that's the electrical sub bid, and then the following week is the um, air conditioning mm -hmm. portion of it. Um, I do have to say that based on, we, we had a walkthrough with all of the prospective vendors uh, last Wednesday, I believe, mm -hmm. and from what I heard from them, this is just a project that's going to have to be done in the summertime. Uh, apparently, and I, I was shocked to hear this, but it's, it's basically a two-month project. Um, so it's not something where they could just get, you know, some large crews in and get it done in a week during vacation time so um, you know just just so you're aware it will definitely be a summer project mm -hmm. and, and uh, hopefully uh, you know the bids will come in with that you know um, now they don't have to clean up and put everything back together every day like they would have had to if they did it during the school year um, we're hoping that we can get the entire school done but if not we do have the option to just get a couple of the wings done so either way Part of that school will be air conditioned by the fall. <laughs> <laughs> Good job, thank you. 
Um, and then we can just jump right into the reports, what we have for our expense report. So I have started to move some of the expenses out. Uh, we had some rather substantial shortfalls, I guess, shall we say, in certain accounts. And I moved some of those out into grants and circuit breaker. I still have some additional movement into the circuit breaker account from one of the spent tuitions accounts to make. And there are other tuition accounts. And the movement of some budget money from uh, one account into one of the spent tuition accounts that will pretty much wipe out that particular shortfall. So, um, page seven. Oh, I'm already, okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I think we were in the tu tuition to non public schools, we were at minus 375 last month. So, right. um, and that will come down again. And uh, the payment to collaborative programs, I believe, were about 139 minus last month, and we're down to 83. That'll be down to about eight or so, um, if not zero, next month. So, I just wanted to kind of give you guys the uh, update on that. The transfers are being done. Um, we're at 76 percent. Uh, we're going to page nine grand total, 76 percent used. And we feel like we're on target. Uh, you know, kind of meeting the mark here, or any any areas of concern? No, because in that 76 percent, you know, there's a lot of encumbrances of, you know, certainly the tuitions, the transportation, mm -hmm. all of that is already encumbered for. So that's included in the 76 percent spent. Um, Income for the entire year. For the whole year. Right. Yeah. And we also have um, some additional school choice money, obviously, that, that was in the budget that we have not utilized yet. So mm -hmm. yeah. we have that as well. Okay. So no, I'm not uh, I'm not overly concerned at this point in time. Pretty much the year is it's not seventy six percent over, but right. you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's close. Yeah. Um, grant report, so you can see with the grants, a couple of them have been fully spent now. Um, this, the 240 SPED education, or special ed grant, you can see um, obviously last month that was considerably less, but I moved the tuitions into that to utilize that. Uh, circuit breaker, we have still $206,000. I won't be using all of that money this year. We'd like to carry some over into next year. Um, and that, that was showing that we wanted to carry about 135000 over um, into next year. So, you know, we have, say, $70,000 left to spend in that account. Um, like the, the, the 262 grant, that's a simple transfer um, that, that pays for a pre-K um, ESP position. And what we will do is just transfer the expenses over and utilize all of those. Uh, the rest of these... Uh, the Title I, certainly, uh, we pay for one teacher and part of the one of the psychologist's salaries. That'll continue to just come down every week. Uh, the 391 grant at the bottom, and I guess I can dovetail right into the pre-K tuition uh, discussion from this, that paid for, at one point in time, it paid for the entire salary of the pre-K um, director as well as part of another teacher's salary. Then it kind of moved down, moved down, and, and of course, <laughs> while the grant's moving down, salaries are moving up, so uh, then it was, well, it covers most of the pre-K director's salary, and now they're phasing it out to the point mm -hmm. of where uh, two years ago it was 61,000, this year it's 45, uh, and next year we're anticipating 30, and the year after that it's, it's gone. So as a result of that, that really puts a lot of pressure on the pre-K program. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I did speak with Lauren Winter this afternoon about that and um, the need basically to somehow make up this money because um, you know what's not paid for either with the tuition for the preschool program or with this grant would come out of the school budget. And as things get squeezed in the school budget, that becomes more and more difficult to actually maintain the program. You know, we don't want to offset those funds uh, to a great deal with the um, with the school budget. So we just um, kind of tossed around some numbers to uh, 
to talk about for a, an increase in the tuition. Uh, we were looking at what would be a 5% increase in the tuition, which turns out to be about a quarter an hour. Um, when I spoke with, uh, with Lauren this afternoon, basically what they're charging right now, and it, it's an incredibly difficult um, tuition scale to discuss because they have rates for one day a week half day and one day a week full day and then it just goes up until you're all the way to five full days um, and then they have half time and full time out of town kind of supplemental fees that that are charged so um, all of those come into play as well so it's not the easiest thing to just say well we can just do this much money um, but all of them are, are based around the fact that they are charging five dollars and fifty cents an hour for um, their services and as as Lauren told me that's what she pays for daycare for one of her children that's too young to uh, to attend the program yet so you know obviously there's certainly a considerable amount of value to a pre-k program uh, and so she thought that you know certainly something that would increase it by that much wouldn't wouldn't you know become too much of a hardship on the families that utilize it but yet will go a long way towards offsetting, you know, some of these grant monies that were lost. And uh, that's something that obviously we need your approval on. So I, you know, if you... Can you remind me why, um, so we approve what their annual tuition is? Uh, you approve basically what, if there's an increase, you, you would approve the okay. amount of the increase. And the 5% increase, would that just be for this year to offset the lower grant? Whereas <clears throat> a year from now, we may be looking at a another bump because the grant may go away the grant is definitely grant going go away. away yeah okay. um and and you know the thought when i spoke with lauren this <laughs> afternoon was that you know just like everything else i mean prices go up every year and, and she said what had happened was we would go five years without raising the rate and then we'd raise it you know not a huge amount but where people would go wow you know we didn't expect that and she said what what might make more sense really is to just have the price go up a certain percentage every year she said that way, you know, we would certainly keep pace with uh, inflation on the salaries and, you know, materials that they utilize. Um, and it allows parents to more or less budget for it, you know, for lack of a better term. Um, you know, a 5% increase if you went five days a week, full days, would be an increase of about $275 a year. So it's not, you know, I mean, that's, it's a 10 month year. So it's, you know, it's 2750 a month, basically. Um, so it's not, again, a huge amount. It's, it's one of those things where times the number of kids, that's where it starts to make right. a difference. Mm -hmm. um, but it will cover us, so 5% will cover the gap? Well, it, it won't cover the gap. No. You know, as, as with a the lot of things, have you have that fine line of, you know, you don't, want to, you don't want to charge too much because then people wouldn't be able to afford to come or would just say, you know, there are alternatives. I won't send my child to a pre-K, right. I'll send them to daycare. Um, so it's one of those things that we have to kind of work toward covering the gap rather than mm -hmm. doing it in one fell swoop. Right. It's almost, it's, it's similar to the school lunch program where, you know, right. that, that's, it loses money. Well, we could raise the price so that it would, you know, not necessarily make money, but certainly break even. But then you'd end up serving to half the number of kids, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. so. And if we don't have a pre-K program, we will pick up pre-K tuitions for students who are eligible for those services. So from ages three to five, where we have to provide students who are eligible for those services, we have to we have to provide that. So that's part of the. We certainly want a viable. We love our preschool. We're very proud of it. And we want a viable program because if we didn't have one. We we'd make it up on the tuition end of things. Tuition plus transportation. Right. And then, um, in addition, what I found was that um, the fact that we have a pre-K program and one that's accessible to students from outside Hadley, it was always sort of a good, mm -hmm. oh, I hadn't considered Hadley, and I really like it here, so mm -hmm. maybe my child wants to Yeah, mm -hmm. right, absolutely. Mm -hmm. absolutely. So how much does the 5% close the gap for next year? Right. Uh, well, we're for next year, the 5%, and, and again, it's difficult to calculate with... Sure the pay scale, but it looks to, to recover around $13,000 of the shortfall, which, you know, for next year would, would pretty much, I mean, it's close. It, we're, we're losing about 15000 yeah. so it's, you know, 
um, it's close to making up that shortfall anyway. Mm -hmm. The good news is that there is money in the revolving account for the pre-K program, um, not nearly as much as there was, say, you know, six or seven years ago, mm -hmm. but um, there's it, still a fairly healthy balance, and, and quite honestly, they're, they're pretty much holding their own in it. It doesn't, in fact, it's on the revolving account report. Right. It's not dropping by, um, you know, forty, fifty thousand dollars a year, which is certainly good. So, Chris, if the five percent gets us an extra thirteen, then next year you'd have to raise it ten, eleven percent to make offset the thirty. Well, at, at that point in time, it, it, I guess we'd have to really just take a good hard look at it. Certainly, get your feedback as well as to what, you know, mm -hmm. how you wanted to handle this. Mm -hmm. um, it, again, it's just one of those things that it's very hard. Once those grant monies disappear, it that really that helped to you know sustain the program for quite some time. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you know, the value of a pre-K program, of course, is it's difficult to measure. But any of the kids that attend that and then remain at Hadley mm -hmm. Elementary. You know, I mean, they've they've gotten teaching basically. Mm -hmm. You know, for two years prior to kindergarten, they also know the building, they know the people. Right. So when they when they jump from that into kindergarten, you know, for lack of a better term, they're veterans of that school already. You know, some, they're mm -hmm. upperclassmen. <laughs> um, you know, they they've been around for two years. So That's you know, fine. and and what yes. happens is they they do better as a mm -hmm. result of that, quite honestly, because there's not that harsh transition from you know wherever they were to the elementary school, you know, so just, you know, just laying out to, to you the financial facts, basically, and at, at some point in time, you know, we'll have to just look at, look at everything, number of students we have, number of positions we have, and, you know, see what can be done there, but. And correct me if I'm wrong, though, Chris, when we look at that budget summary, right, and so the budget summary document does not, so it assumes the decrease of the $14,000. Right. And it doesn't assume that the additional revenue has been added. No. It so technically, and we still are in very good shape. I would, I would argue that in order to avoid a 10% increase next year, this remains as it is, that, that any additional revenues go into revolving so that the only increase that's required would be something similar. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So you don't have to make up 30, then you have to make up 15. Right. right. I, and I don't know how, what purview we have over the messaging associated with the tuition increase, but it seems like this is a known quantity that is going away. So mm -hmm. whatever can be communicated about this grant is decreasing in funding next year and disappearing after mm -hmm. that. Yeah. So it's not, this may not be a one-time increase. There may be a future. I don't know, I feel like parents would appreciate hearing that, just we know that this is coming. We just don't know what the, the scope, mm -hmm. you know, what the magnitude of the increase may be in the next year. Right, in that messaging, you'd also want to tout the benefits of the pre-K program. Yeah. Sure. yeah. Mm -hmm. And the advertising of the program, just thinking like long-term longevity of the school in general, as Chris said, it's, you know, it's really helping kids get used to it, they've got, and, hand, they've been in the preschool, they transition, they're comfortable, they're gonna do better in school. You know, it seems to me pretty logical that we don't we don't want to see that preschool program gone. So just thinking long term as a school committee how we can consider promoting and advertising our yeah. as young as our pre K. Mm -hmm. If we even if we yeah. have the I think it makes sense to, to do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just knowing the stance and the future of yeah. the district in general starting really early. Right. Absolutely. And it's a great program. So the revolving account for preschool, the dollars that we see here, is all of that from tuition, or can you tell, like, where does this come from and where, and how is it used? This is all the tuition money. Yeah. Um, you know, the grant money does not go into this account, it's kept separately. Okay. So what this um, tuition account pays for is basically all of the staff and any materials that she buys. Um, not necessarily paper, you know, things like that, where obviously she goes down to the office and, mm -hmm. and grabs paper, but, uh, you know, things like snacks or, you know, particular right. items associated mm -hmm. just with the preschool program, that would come out of there as well. So at the end of this fiscal year, where would we anticipate that revolving account being? Is that, Annie, what you were saying is connected to the pre-K revolving on no. the budget? 
No, what I was saying is connected to it is where you get down to the 391 grant. Mm -hmm. Oh, so yeah, that, okay. that, that's where I was connecting it. Okay. 391 grant. So that we're looking not at putting that $14,000 back in, then, then we avoid Here. having to say it's a 10% next year. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. We're looking at about 81, 81.5 in the account right now. Uh, we have that three thousand six hundred and something dollars for the two sixty two grant that we're going to transfer the expenses out of the preschool, so that's actually going to raise the balance by that much money and bring it yep. back up, you know, to say eighty five thousand. Um, I would anticipate that it would remain right around that dollar amount until the end of the year. So that's yeah. Well, that's that will be with next year's, and then next year we're going to utilize a pretty decent portion of that. Um, and it would be, you get about $115,000 in revenues. Um, Added to your ending balance. So we, yeah, so we, we'd end up using, you know, a, a half of that next year. I see, okay. Mm -hmm. so this is all before any kind of increase, of course. Right, so right. Yeah. So even though it shows that large change, uh, I'm going back to the mm -hmm. budget summary, for FY19, where mm -hmm. you were showing that it's going to be 156 um, of income, mm -hmm. of revenue for FY19, we're saying it's also the grant is decreased, and are is there a goal to leave a certain balance at the end of each year in that revolving account? Well, the goal would be to try to keep it within, say, my screen keeps showing up, between uh, ten and twenty thousand dollars less than what you started the year at, but. Again, I just you know I can't say how sustainable that is. Um, my my guess would be that at the end of next year we'd be looking more at a forty to fifty thousand dollar balance. Mm -hmm. So is it clear that that there's a spend on that? Like that that's the part I just want to make sure is not misinterpreted as somebody saying this as well. It's making a lot more. It's making twice as much in FY nineteen the pre K revolving. Yeah, it's not it's not really making twice as much. Yeah, we're spending twice as much, I guess. Um, yeah, I know they're, they're called revenues. Really, it's not necessarily revenues because you know we've got eighty two thousand dollars sitting in the account right now. So it's it, it's not just spending your earnings. You're also spending some of your savings as well, more or less. Okay. On a student size, did you get an idea from Lauren at all? If the student size, like their enrollment size. The is next year, we don't have the census data yet. In general, like over the years, though, like have they been declining? I, I know that we've always talked about birth rate. I mean, last year, um, I didn't feel like there were any significant. Uh, well, I take that back. I mean, part of we have this problem with declining enrollment overall. Right. So I take that back. There was a time, I believe, in Hadley Long before I was here, where you actually had three pre-K classrooms, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. um, so certainly it has declined because you have one fewer classroom overall. But in the years, in the four years that I've been here, mm -hmm. it hasn't, we haven't seen huge swings. And we take kids outside of Hadley mm -hmm. as well. We do. So yeah, can we add this in the known? I'm just wondering if this is a good bullet to just put in there, that we know that this grant is going away in two years. Mm -hmm. um, and as a yeah, result, good. you know, we're recommending or, or we're supporting a tuition increase. Mm -hmm. You know, just need to the tuition increase that we agreed to. Great. I got that with lunch, Chris. Come on. What's that? What about the lunch? Lunch. You put the caveat right in the bottom. Oh, I'm sorry. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> do we need to yeah. vote to approve the increase? Yes, you and you do. Okay. And if you have a child that attends the program, you need to abstain from the vote. Because you have, if you have a vested interest in, in the cost of the program, you need to abstain. Right. Okay, so, um, so are we in agreement that 5%, the recommendation as, as proposed and agreed to as being reasonable from the director? that makes sense for this fiscal year? And do you want that framed in a dollar amount as 575? I, I think it's better to probably just say 5% increase. Oh, 5% That increase. way I could apply it also to the out-of-town okay. um, okay. additional amount that they 
they're mm -hmm. charged. So sure. is there a motion to um, approve a 5% increase to preschool tuition for fiscal year 19? Yes. So moved. Okay, second. second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And one abstention. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now on to the lunch, yes. Come on. Oh, I really wanted this month to be the month where we went back up. And, and actually, I went to the town hall and, and I said, you know, where are those revenues posted? Yeah, I know. Yeah, she's just rubbing her hands. <laughs> I got to tell you, I'd be embarrassed if I were you. I mean, I'd be, I wouldn't have shown up tonight. 34 bucks, I wouldn't be here. Um, and, and you know what happened, really? I, I, because I asked Linda at the town hall, hey, can we, can we post these revenues? And they haven't even come from the state yet. Uh, for January, which when was I there what last it? Wednesday? So it just it wasn't even on the vendor web, which is the site I go to to see all the payments that come to the town, and it wasn't even on there yet. So they're just they're a little slow. Why does the athletic go down over there? Uh, we have the scoreboard in the gym that the revolving account paid for, okay. and that was really that big drop of say eleven thousand dollars. And then it goes up as revenue from the games comes in. Yeah. Yes, as the eight money comes in, and and remember this year we're also paying for after school supervision for um, students who stay and are in the study hall, and we're paying for that out of athletic revolving. So just a question because I forget athletic that amount is that different than the boosters? Absolutely. Yes. Okay, got it. Yeah, the boosters are an entirely separate, separate organization. Yep, that's their own money. Okay. Perfect. They're very generous with that money, but we don't. We don't track, you know, that count it. It's okay. the same with a PTO or something like that. Mm -hmm. Same right. type of thing. Anything else, Chris? I had one other item here, which I'm sorry, it's not on the agenda. It was just some housekeeping with some student activity accounts. Mm -hmm. um, I have a copy of the policy here as well. Uh, the school committee policy says that um, after three years from the date of graduation, the class accounts must be closed. Um, and we have some here that basically are inactive. Um, you know, Dee has reached out to the, I forgot if it was treasurer or class president, one or the other, and uh, have been unable to get those accounts closed. So per policy, they have to go uh, just into the general student activity account. Um, and then we just have a few other accounts. Um, we're student activity accounts that are just no longer being used. Uh, the last time any of these were used was June of 2013, and that was only because they moved when TD Bank closed and they moved to East Hampton Savings. So that, that was literally the use in 2013 was <laughs> moving the account. So I mean, it, it's been years. Um, basically, it, I'm trying to look here, it comes to, we're, we're holding off on one of them because she's been emailing back and forth. So it looks like it's around, say, $4,300 total. Um, and that, I think it says that we need the school committee to approve that. Yes, yeah, it says upon it's approval of the school fund. committee. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's the, um, the closing of any student activity fund okay. requires approval of the school committee. And so do you want to list the, the ones that are being closed? Just I can, sure. Them? Uh, class of 2006, do you want the dollar amounts too? They don't have to approve the dollar amount. Will they just go into the, the public record, the packet? The yes. Sheet. Yeah. So okay. okay. Uh, $125. Class of 2011 was $1,780.35. Class of 2012, $653.37. Then we have a health student activity account, $494.68. We have industrial arts, 285.70. Publications, 688.47. We have just one called Other, uh, 44.59. Uh, it was the other club. It's widely it's popular. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's stick with it. And publications isn't your book? Yeah. Okay. No, no. Um, technology, $50. And VHS, 132.48. It holds up. <laughs> it's, it's. I guess the beta club is still, uh, it's, it's still in function. Um, and yeah, so that it, it comes to around forty three hundred dollars. This, the class of two thousand thirteen is also in there with eighteen hundred eighty one dollars. So, the total sixty one hundred dollars. So about forty three hundred. How long do we have to hold on to them before they can be? 
three years. Three, three years. years. And they're yeah. active for three years. You should vote them to close them. And the money then goes to the general student activity fund and the kinds of things that we would use for that. For example, right now we have student activity clubs that don't do a lot of revenue raising, some of the gender equity work. The key club just started. Also, uh, that would be a place where you could look for scholarship funds for students for right. activities they couldn't afford. The only thing is it has to remain, it can only be used for uh, the benefit of students directly. So we can't yeah. move it into operating costs or it has to go to students. It's something that benefits students. Great. So a motion to move these dollars as proposed. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Thank you. Do you need anything? I don't need that. Okay. Um, we ready to move to school committee reports and discussion? Mm -hmm. Negotiations, Tara. So hopefully we will finish up tonight. Right. We're going to go into the exact session and talk yeah. about that. Okay. Mm -hmm. That will be it. Um, policy. Social media acceptable use final reading. Yeah, so this is the second it was in your packet last week. Mm -hmm. Last week. Last, last month. Week. And so this would be the second reading, as I said, already reviewed by the attorney. Are there any recommended revisions or questions to the social media acceptable use policy? No, but just a comment that mm -hmm. um, I missed last meeting, and I'm, um, I have to admit this is the first time I'm actually seeing it, mm -hmm. and I think it's a great, um, a great set of training wheels for responsible use by students overseen by advisors and for other students to sort of bear witness to what that kind of responsible use looks like. So this is great. Cool. Good. So we do need a. Um, a I just want to say my only recommendation. I believe I brought this up last time, oh, and it doesn't something? have to be in. The, it doesn't have to be part of this policy, um, but just to incorporate some form of comment policy um, on any accounts that are brought that are put forward, um, so that you so that that would guide the comments that people are like leaving on these accounts. Okay. Right. But whether you allow comments like, or not like, allowed? And, like, and like what can be, and who? What, what, what is allowed in the comments um, yeah. to try to, to, to try mainly um, to try to deter any form of bullying, derogatory remarks, vulgar, vulgarity, that kind of stuff. Is that, that's perfect. I feel like there is some something about the that goes when you go to the like the, the student council instagram there's something to the effect of i feel like there's something there that says you know the moderator has the right to mm -hmm. take something away the unacceptable use part engage in cyberbullying, threatening behavior harassment or disrespectful contact towards others or use of language online that would be unacceptable in the school community i think we're trying to get a little bit of that as kind of a catch-all of if you couldn't say it in school you can't say it online but uh, the thing, like when I read this, and perhaps I'm just reading it, I'm reading it improperly. Um, I'm reading this as the as the, this is what's going to guide the creators people that are the, the creators of the account. Not the, this isn't going to guide the public that are on the account. Okay, all right. Yes, I will. You did bring that up. I, I'm sorry it's not in here. I don't know to your point that it would be because. Yes, we will address that. I don't know if it'd be in a policy because I don't have any authority over. Right, you're right. This is right. about the students in here. I can enforce this, we don't but we do have to communicate over what people post. But we do have the right to take over their down. reaction to it and have, right exactly zero tolerance policy for right, uh, right, right. So right. we certainly have the authority to take it down and making that clear to people. Yeah. So I would just, I would just, right. I would just encourage whatever accounts are created yeah. to include language like as you include language like that. Absolutely. So this would need okay. people are ready. Okay. So with that, um, with that uh, addition, otherwise, were there any other recommendations or feedback on the policy? Okay. And so just to be clear, I'm I'm not changing the language here. I'm going to direct people procedurally that they have to account for that and make it clear to the public that we can take down any post mm -hmm. or. That would be my recommendation. Okay. All right. Okay. Is there a motion? Motion to adopt the social media policy. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. And um, otherwise, 
think we also have another policy meeting coming up mm -hmm. <laughs> in March. Yeah. Well, Rescheduled. You know. <laughs> Just put their time. And um, I did speak with Travis with the oh, CES for that, um, mm -hmm. with, with, with that tool. I don't know if that's something that I should address here or something that I should address with you off offline or I don't know that. Sure. So, um, so, well, so basically, um, that, that tool that you brought for yeah. last week or last, or last month. Um, their idea for this tool would be um, for so, for social media posting. Um, its main benefit would be if it's something that would, if if um, you'd be managing more than one style of account. So if you were managing like a Facebook and a and a Twitter, um, so you could post one thing to both accounts. Um, but also to, it would bring in those um, text messages to parents and um, robocalls and stuff like that. So kind of the stuff that I believe we already after school brain. Um, so it seems to me at this point that we'd be better off not adopting that, that tool and just work um, natively within whatever social media um, which uh, we, we would be uh, pursuing as a district. So you made that point last time. Mm -hmm. Pick one and use it. And then my recommendation would be I'd have to perhaps um, if the school committee is comfortable with this that I could speak with you more Keith around some ideas. I know I know what my limits are just in terms of time and management. Mm -hmm. So I, I would want to identify something that at the start allows information to get out mm -hmm. in a way other than email, but that doesn't require me to manage a bunch of content, right. comments, and I, I just, there's no way I can do that. Yeah, and again, I would love, I'd yeah. like to find time with you so we can try to come together, come up with some form of at least skeleton of a social media plan for the district, and then maybe bring that up to school committee or do it with, um, whatever we'd have to do for the next step. That'd be great if folks are comfortable with that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. I'm glad that's Thank an area you. of your expertise. <laughs> yeah. Two areas of his expertise. Check. Keep the superintendent out of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. Very simple. All right. Finance Tribord. So we're going to be meeting mm -hmm. um, March 6th mm -hmm. to present the um, proposed yep. budget, FY19 plan. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, um, were there any other updates, outcomes from recent meetings on finance for the board? I was at the last one, as I told you, the um, just that discussion about the special ed stabilization fund. I asked that question, and uh, and then FinCom is going to meet with every single department. Right. Okay. So as far as pursuing the special ed stabilization fund, is that something that we should discuss with the FinCom? Group and uh, I mean, is this something that I would imagine that at all? Now? No, I would imagine at all tri board meetings going forward, it has a placeholder. Okay, it has a placeholder as a warrant article. I would imagine at future tri board meetings that they're going to go through the warrant articles one by one, yes, and then they won't make a final vote on what goes on the warrant pertaining to the schools without input from the school committee. So, my expectation is that there'll be a discussion at um, all the March. Yeah, the tri board meetings. Okay. Board. So, assuming there's a discussion at the next tri board meeting, we can um, get a summary out to you guys of the, the definition of what they're looking to do, where that's coming from, mm -hmm. and how that would impact us so that we can make a educated decision about right. moving forward. And if it is something that requires, so I don't think that it, requ you could make sure that you vote by uh, your April meeting because the warrant is the, that first yeah. week in May. So you could certainly make sure you vote your opinion on whether or not you support it. Um, but, you know, technically, so you could do that. If you didn't do that, it wouldn't matter because the Warren article says you have to vote anyway. So if you do it before, you, if you didn't vote it, it just wouldn't come to fruition. Okay. Okay, fields. Oh. Uh, have you built yet? Yes. <laughs> Next week. Uh, we've started um, with some fundraising to local businesses. Mm -hmm. and, um, Thank you to East Hampton Savings Bank. What appears to be that they, they are willing to discuss a donation of $5,000 at this point. Terrific. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. That's awesome. Thank you to Eric and Annie and Dr. Z. It's Rod mm -hmm. Beck for making that connection. Uh, and we're still working on the uh, private donation campaign. There's some work that's not quite ready to have it fully unveiled with them. Um, Online giving and uh, signing out front, but soon Andy and Eric and I are talking about meeting. Mm -hmm. So we're still looking to um, for 
fundraising to make up uh, the amount needed to do the mm -hmm. first phase. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, and Himera, the CES. Yeah, so I went to the January meeting and uh, shared with you all the report, um, the executive director's report to the board of directors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Annie, for adding it to the packet. Mm -hmm. I wanted to highlight one specific um, highlight of the meeting, that was part of the, of the meeting that I um, was especially proud of, of Hadley. Mm -hmm. um, they had their spiffy person giving a report about spiffy data in the region and um, an amazing, amazing report, an amazing report on um, on vaping and mm -hmm. some of the statistics that are coming out about e-cigarettes and use of vaping. Um, students apparently are, um, you know, in high numbers saying absolutely not that they smoke a cigarette. But would they vape? Yeah, 45% of them have vaped in the broader mm -hmm. region, which is an astonishingly high number. Mm -hmm. It was a pretty amazing presentation. I highly recommend we find some way of getting that information in front of the um, in front of the school committee. Okay. Um, as um, through perhaps Renee's next presentation. Um, but the immediately, you know, the question that immediately followed from this very large. CES board was, um, is there any reason why a superintendent wouldn't bring this data forward to their school committee? And, um, and I was very proud that it's not the case here. We mm -hmm. brought it year after mm -hmm. year. We make informed decisions based on mm -hmm. the data that um, uh, advise how we um, manage our health program and also the way in which our superintendent communicates weekly um, about matters of social emotional health and mm -hmm. wellness and um, so it was a point of pride thank you thank you um so that's all i have to say about this. i i have to say this thank you very much for that comment and i'm thinking my goodness if big tobacco can figure out how to continue to sell big tobacco i have got to be able to figure out how to sell hopkins academy i mean that's pretty <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, this is actually a good place that's healthy and helpful that's right Always oh, covered spiffy endables. I know, I noticed that. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't quite sure if that was an adjective. Or or yeah. <laughs> he was spiffy. <laughs> That's great. Okay, so action items. We have a couple left. So um, the first one, you abstain from. Yeah, okay. so I'll abstain from the uh, accounts payable warrants, but uh, do we have a motion uh, for approval of the AP warrants submitted in February 2018? So Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Abstain. Okay, um, approval of the January 25th, 2018 minutes. Any questions, revisions, concerns on those minutes? Okay, is there a motion? Move to approve the minutes of January 25th. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, approval of warrants submitted in February 2018. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We get the second reading in social mm -hmm. media, we approve the field trip, and we approve the number of school choice slots. Okay, so um, next regular meeting date would be what? It's 326. Is that right? 325? Well, let's see here. 26. 1, 2, 3, 4, 26. March 26. Any. Um, Concerns, conflicts. March twenty sixth, you said. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Fourth Friday, Monday. Mm -hmm. Okay. Five thirty. We'll plan on five thirty. Um, sounds like we're going to try to do an exec session if we can with um, yes. police mm -hmm. and or fire mm -hmm. uh, on school um, safety items yeah. and priorities. Okay, so I just need somebody to motion to um, enter into executive session. The wording is um, under number two of the agenda. If you want to read that out loud, and we'll do a roll call vote. I'll go ahead. Chair will entertain a motion to enter executive session to discuss strategies with respect to collective negotiations. 
uh, a motion to move into executive session to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining. I have determined an, an open meeting would have detrimental effect on the bargaining position of the public body and to reconvene an open session. Is there a second? Second. Okay, we'll call the Keith. Aye. Uh, Tara? Aye. Kamara? Aye. Paul? Aye. Me? Yes. Aye. Well, we okay. need to reconvene an open session. Because you have to you have to report the vote out. Only for that. We will reconvene yeah. to report out the vote. We will now um, move into executive session. Do we know if this is in Here we are in open session. The outcome <laughs> will be uh, <laughs> for our audience. <laughs> don't, really, you don't have to. We all have comes on. <laughs> we have a unanimous approval for, of the uh, negotiations with the Unit D uh, contract, which are the educator service personnel. Yes. Yeah. ESPs. That's it. That's it. Great. Great. Okay. Uh, yes. Second. <laughs> All in favor. Aye. 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 <laughs> See you in March. <laughs>